again back to no mask. Well, good morning, everybody. Now we start. So welcome and thanks for taking your time to do this trip here to the VC Enron Center. Uh, for those of you that already know it, you know it's beautiful. For those of you first time, please take also a minute to enjoy the surroundings, okay? So uh, this is a workshop, the final workshop of one of the projects that we are managing, the project Reality. This is a bit the motto, empowering drones with EGNOS. And uh, this is a bit the people that are here. We'll have plenty of time ahead of us to introduce ourselves, to, uh, to explain everything that we've done or what we've done so far. This is a workshop, it's not a project meeting, it's nothing really boring, hope so. Uh, for you guys, so uh, you know, we have the chance to you know uh, talk about work, uh, to to yeah, to get your impressions, etc. You know how it works. So um, uh, yeah, hopefully you're comfortable. We have to you know stick a bit to the protocol still with the masks and the and the things, but uh, hopefully that's not too painful. And uh, this is a bit of the agenda for today. We are a bit delayed, but I think we are still fine. Starting with this first part, where we basically have to introduce the project to you, so you know what we're talking about. And then uh, basically focusing on the motivation and the logic of this project, how the project is organized and how we, how we work. Also introducing some basic concepts that are needed for, uh, to understand whatever we explain in here. Um, then we will start with the partners uh, uh, presentation, some of them, including the European Agency for the Space Program. So uh, we'll have a presentation and then we'll break at some point and weather dependent here, if weather uh, let us, we will do a short flight demo with one of the platforms that we've been using um, in the testings of the, of the project. Okay. That will lead us to part two, technical activities and main results, some other partner presentations. And finally, we open the floor, Q&A. Hopefully we're not too hungry, or, or we might be, but uh, still if you have time and energy for that, we can have some Q&A before going to lunch, okay? And the first, very first thing I wanted to talk about was about you, about who we have here today. And this is a bit about you, the representation of who you are and where you come from. So several sectors, we are actually very happy that we have gathered these different uh, spheres of the drone, let's say, ecosystem. We have manufacturers, we have services, navigation, uh, hardware and software, people from university, public agencies, institutions and others. So you guys figure out now where, where you are and you figure out where others are. So thanks for coming. <clears throat> happy to shake hands again. If we have some uh, sanitizing gel, then it's better. And uh, yeah, that's uh, how we start the workshop about you. One first thing we should talk about also is about the name, right? So reality is not, it is a noun, but it's not a name, you know, without meaning. It's actually an acronym. And the acronym stands for RPIS, EGNOS Adoption and Liaison with Integrity. Okay, that's the acronym for reality. I highlighted here three words which I wanted to start with, uh, which is RPIS. Some of you, according to my previous slide, know the term, you know what we're talking about. Second term is EGNOS. Some of you also know what is it about. And finally, we will talk about integrity. Maybe that's not a well-known topic for, uh, for most of you, let's say, and we will try to do our best on explaining this, which is not an easy concept in any case. So let me start by, by explaining this three things, okay? Um, about drones, I wanted to start with a non-common definition. You know, we always uh, talk about RPISs or drones or UAVs or UASs, you know, there's this bunch of uh, terminology. I put it this on the title just to get rid of it, okay? I will talk about, generally speaking, about drones, okay? And we all know what we mean because there's subtle differences between each of them. And I wanted to start with a definition which is not common, which is actually not technical, uh, definition, uh, not uh, oriented to operations, but oriented to business, okay? So uh, the drones can be defined as a highly scalable, digital empowered, data-driven business based on the occupation of a portion of the airspace, okay? We might agree on some terms of definition, but this is orienting this definition towards what drone mean 
as a sector, as a business, as an opportunity for, for business in the future, okay? We all have heard these numbers about drones, hundreds of thousands of platforms for that year, for the other year, uh, kilo euros, billion of, of dollars about this business. And that's uh, becoming a reality and probably we still need some years to see you know, how everything unleashes. And for that to happen, for this business to be a big thing, um, we, uh, there are some drivers or some challenges ahead of us. I highlighted here two of them, which I find uh, relevant for today. <clears throat> the first is that we are going to integration more than segregation. I actually learned the English word segregation uh, in the drone sector, right? We always started saying some years ago, drones work in a segregated area. We need to segregate areas to operate drones. Okay, that's been happening and that's the way of, to work comfortable, let's say, but more and more we hear that we have to go to integration, to everything integrated all together. Everything, I mean, drones with aviation, with cities, with everything you can imagine. So more aircraft sharing the air. The other message is, if we really want this definition to become a reality, we have to think that if we have no navigation, there is no automation. We all agree that the power of drones or the, the potential relies on the fact that they are autonomous, that there is no guy behind you know, flying the thing. Um, and for that, we need navigation. And so if there is no navigation, there is no automation. And if there is no automation, there is no scalability, right? So that slide a bit connects the, the panorama of the drones with the drivers or challenges that we need to face. And I end up this with this question saying how important is safe navigation in this context? This is a rhetorical question, you don't have to answer, but you can guess the answer, okay? This is about drones. What about EGNOS? Second thing I wanted to, to talk about. I'm not going into details for that. I know that uh, uh, we will have a later presentation about EGNOS as well, so um, let me just highlight, again, starting with a definition which is not common for EGNOS, which is an opportunity to make accurate satellite navigation accessible and for free, okay? So basically what EGNOS is, is a system that improves the current GPS, okay? How they do that? You have your constellation of GPS satellites, you monitor those on some stations, and because you know where the stations are, you basically can compute the errors associated to each of the satellites of the GPS okay, constellation. You take these corrections and you send them back to some other satellites so that they, they broadcast, it, broadcast it to the majority of the users. Okay? So if you are a user, you get your GPS satellites on one side, you get corrections on the other side, you mix the two things and bingo, you have an improvement. The benefits of EGNOS are roughly speaking, in terms of accuracy, around three meters in horizontal position, 95%, and four meters in the vertical, 95%. That's on the spec. This is what the guarantee, the commitment for EGNOS, but in reality, actually, it's better than that, okay? EGNOS is also providing another service, not just the accuracy service, but another service which is called Integrity. We will see plenty of stuff about this later on. And basically, the idea to retain here is that Integrity is a protection of your position, a guarantee, guarantee of your position, which is even used by aviation. So it's aviation grade, meaning that, you know, uh, you are assuming very low risk when using this uh, integrity protection. Rough message, okay? So nothing else on the slide. Yes, one, one more thing. How, how weird is this EGNOS thing? If I'm a drone operator, uh, you know, how far I'm from this? Well, you are not. You, most of you, those of you integrating navigation systems know probably this brand, Swiss brand, very famous one, and actually this model. This model was integrated in say 99% of the drone autopilots and navigation systems some years ago. So, you know, they put the first stone, they're there. Uh, this can come encapsulated in several formats, probably you know those, but inside those are these ones, right? And this chipset is uh, equipped and it's enabled for EGNOS, right? Uh, you just have to go to your configuration screen and, you know, click on the enabling uh, of EGNOS and that's it. You're receiving already corrections, your receiver knows what to do and you're benefiting from that improved accuracy, which by the way, GPS goes into the 8, 9 meters down to the 3, 4 that I mentioned before, okay? 
So as easy as that. So the message is um, we can all benefit from EGNOS straightforward. And the question or one of the questions that we wanted to solve in this project is, OK, but is it necessary and or sufficient to have EGNOS for drone navigation? How far uh, is necessary or sufficient? The previous question was maybe easy. This one is maybe not that easy, but hopefully we'll get a, an answer by the end. And third thing that I wanted to talk here today is about the unknown and uncomfortable truth, okay, in general terms. And let me start with a sentence from an American uh, writer, end of uh, 19th century, Mark Twain. The sentence says, it ain't what you don't know that gets you in trouble, it's what you know for sure that just ain't so. The sentence is a bit complicated, so let me, let me reformulate it. Basically, you, uh, you, know, you, you trust things in general, right? The problem comes when the things you trust are not what they look like or not what they think, what you think you are, okay? And that statement, which is very generic, is actually the spirit of navigation integrity and how it goes. Let me put some figures here for you to illustrate. Suppose you have this situation, right? Some of you are drone operators. You are doing your mission. You're planning your mission. You have this very beautiful building, which is surrounded by an area that you cannot fly, right? Typical no-fly zone, which is defined geographically by some box. And you define your mission. You should be there, you know, I don't know, inspecting, watching, or doing something with your drone. This is where you should be. You should be there. This is the mission plan, what you define, so you know it, okay? The thing is that, <clears throat> in reality, you think you are here. This is what your drone tells you, what your navigation system tells you. You got a position, a spot in the map, and not necessarily it's the same place. You want to be here, but somebody, the drone, is telling you, well, I'm actually here. Theoretically, it should be close. You want this to be close, okay? But what happens in reality is that you are here. You might be here, okay? The truth, not what navigator tells, but the actual truth position in the space. So we actually have three elements in here. Um, and let's analyze a little bit where they come from. So let's start <clears throat> by the first one. So the difference between where the navigation is telling you and what the flight plan, the, the, where the flight plan is, okay? Well, if the drone is separated from your flight plan, it means that, the, that this is the autopilot task. The autopilot is just a piece of equipment saying, if I want to be here and I'm here, I have to you know, correct through controls and get back to the, to the place. So this difference depends on the type of autopilot, the type of drone, it's not the same, a multicopter than an aircraft, a fixed wing, and also it might depend on the flight procedure. Let's imagine that you have defined a, a mission which is, you know, fairly challenging to the drone that you have. The drone tries to fly it, but you know, uh, it, it succeeds to a certain point. So all these elements mix up in this type of difference, in this type of error, okay? Second error is easier to understand. One thing is what the navigation system tells you and the other is the truth. And the error of this navigation system is causing this difference, okay? So in practice, let's set up from now on that we have these three elements where you should be, where you think we are and where you truly are, okay? Of course, the problem is when you really are falls in some area that you don't want to be. So integrity, it's exactly this for navigation. So it's getting navigation, but with special guarantees. So a guarantee of saying, okay, you're here and not more than this, okay? This is the concept for integrity. Should an integrity be an integral part of drone navigation? Again, this is, a, I think, an, an easy answer. Uh, to the question, okay? So drones, <coughs> EGNOS, and integrity. That's a bit the basis for the project that we are presenting today, for the work we are presenting. So I introduce you to the reality project in a nutshell, in one, in one slide. So this is a, a project funded by the European Agency for the Space Program, now called USPA. Some time ago it was called GSA, and some other years ago it was called uh, another way. And uh, this, is, this project is funded through the program for EGNOS adoption in aviation and specifically for the development of enablers and other EGNOS-based uh, operations, okay? Um, this is a project uh, that has, uh, well, it's a 24-month uh, project, plus six here because we extended this for the reasons that you know, for the COVID uh, pandemic, we had to 
Exenda Alia bit this project. We are six partners and three different countries represented uh, here. I always have to check because I, I'm afraid of missing one, one country, but it's three countries. Um, the EUSPA agency is based in Prague. This is why I'm, I'm signaling the, the Czech Republic. And to sum up or to summarize the project, I can say we have been dealing with four real life scenarios for drone operations. We have been using five different drones actually within the project and we have achieved the number of more than 100 flights uh, during this project, okay? With one goal, to draw and show this concept about how to adopt EGNOS for drone operations, okay? This is the summary. And uh, this is a bit the, uh, the idea where we want to go, right? Or what, what are we targeting, right? If we have to imagine this future that I depicted before in some slide, but this big business in the future, we need to buy to, to build some something like this, right? Roads, safe roads in which the drones can move freely uh, in a coordinated way, in a, in a safe way in terms of separation, in terms of performance, okay? Uh, so if you, if you want to build these sky roads, it takes a good team, okay? So now I'm taking the chance to introduce a bit the team. So first company in the, in the consortium I want to introduce is Zero USC Italy uh, that was in charge of uh, dealing with regulations and safety assessments for the project. This you need to do to understand what is the regulations, what are the regulations uh, for drones. So Matteo Natale, welcome, uh, thanks for coming. Next is uh, Pildo Labs. Uh, Pildo Labs has been dealing with um, the flight procedures, the operations, how to design those for, for drone missions, that an important part for that. And also, uh, uh, Pildo has been the partner on bringing the necessary instrumentation to do all the testing that we will show later. So Santi Villardaga, Santi Soleil from Pildo, thanks for coming. Next one, genomerics. Uh, we have been dealing uh, with the navigation analysis, um, processing all the data collected from these more than 100 flights and extracting hopefully something meaningful out of it. So myself, Pere Molina from Genomerics and Ismael Colomina, CEO of Genomerics, are here around. And um, next one, um, another task you have to perform is to understand, because this is a navigation project, it is a GNSS satellite navigation project, you have to understand this in depth not just for the current situation, but also for the future panorama of GS GNSS, which is definitely very interesting. Pedro Dente from Deimos, thanks for coming. Um, and finally, or last, last two partners here, uh, we wanted uh, partners that could integrate everything on their drones and fly and you know, go for massive testing for that. So one of the partners is uh, Fadakatek, uh, that they, they, they did the integration of our equipment and the testing flight. So back there, Maria Jose from Catec, thank you for coming, welcome. And finally, Cat UAV again also for the integration of equipment and massive testing. Uh, Conrad, Jordi, thanks, thanks for coming or thanks for hosting us actually. <laughs> thanks for coming, yes. Okay, great, so this is the team. And actually one final note about this, I'm proud to say that this is the first time that we're gathering these two centers, which are the two Spanish civilian drone testing centers, and they, they are the two represented in the consortium. So I think that's a great pleasure and great advantage mm -hmm. for the project. So that's the team. Um, now, some more speaking from my side before I go, before we go with other presentations, I wanted to talk about the logic of the project. So how we manage, how we worked on the project, how it all started, how we designed this. I remember conversations with Santi at the beginning about this. We said, look, we need to base our project in real life. That's for sure. We don't want to make you know, exercises which are isolated. So we want to see what's there in real life, bring it to a laboratory environment where we can test things. And anything we test, any conclusions we get, we should you know, be coming back again and elevate those again, to real life, right? So the first step was saying, okay, we need to define, define some scenarios, uh, common scenarios or typical scenarios of drone operations, and let's see what we can do with the people we are, right? So finally, we selected some uh, real life scenarios. First one being maritime surveillance. Second one being firefighting support to operations, okay? 
The third one, one of the most common one or more hyped, let's say, maybe ones, um, drone package delivery. And fourth one, urban, uh, urban mapping, okay, with drones. Okay, so we thought with these four we can get a good start. So first ta task we need to do is to understand those. We need to take these four and produce what is called the CONOPS, the concept of operations. So what platforms, what type of trajectories, um, how are the measures that have to be in place for these, okay, for these operations to happen. And also perform safety assessments. We have to understand how, or how, we, how we safe within these scenarios, okay? how, how we can make them safe. Um, so from this first exercise, we produced a SORA analysis. Some of you will be familiar with this, so safety assessments for, for each of these. We also extracted common trajectory typologies, so how these platforms should fly to perform these missions, which are very different, and a priori performance expectations. We wanted to know a priori, you know, how good we should be or we could be, okay? From this central element, the trajectories representing each, we decided that we have to put in this machine, which is, you know, fly, process, analyze, and do this as many times as we could in a laboratory environment, okay? So this is where the 100 flights, more than 100 flights come into a place. Why for? To extract realistic performance results. And with these performance results, we expect to derive some conclusions that we go mainly to three actors. First of all, policies in GNSS, so the ones that are regulating uh, the GNSS currently. Secondly, the RPAS operators, drone operators. And thirdly, regulators, so those putting regulators in place. So our goal, our final goal in reality is to elevate these conclusions back to real life, okay? This is a bit the logic of the project. Of the project. About the trajectory typologies, I wanted to make this note or, or a bit the sketch of the exercise with it. So we thought of, for example, maritime surveillance. We know these missions are usually, uh, usually done by patrol or scanning patterns, right? Flying on the sea or maybe tracking some object or maybe just randomly flying. And typically, or at least we thought we could do that, or we can think of these uh, as scenarios done, operated by fixed wing uh, platforms, okay? For fi firefighting support, we know uh, that these are usually done by hovering missions where you do surveillance of the firefighting, but there's also this a scenario of carousel flights, you know, these flights where you go to somewhere, you do the turn and you kind of make this circuit because drones are also used for actually loading and dumping water in support for some operations, especially with bigger rotary wing uh, platforms, okay? For helicopter type platforms, let's say. Um, for package delivery, that's a complete uh, different story. You don't even take off and land in the same position. You do A to B, okay, uh, and back. But the type of trajectories are these more linear ones, A to B, not taking off and landing on the same spot. And we envision these operations with uh, rotary wing, uh, rotary wing uh, platforms, okay? Finally, for urban mapping, this is common to do these missions with a scanning, with scanning patterns, with parallel lines, etc. especially when you go with fixed wings, which are, you know, more productive for urban mapping operations, okay? Based on these typologies, we said, okay, we'll bring this to lab and we will have to, of course, we have to constrain everything and do it in the lab. And we will do this, we're using two types of drones, fixed wing and rotor wing, and we will, de we will design two types of flights. A simpler one, but longer one, with longer segments, what we call linear here, and a more complex one, a scanning one, which will represent uh, a bit the other scenarios. So you have to see a bit the uh, logic of this breaking down into this, of course, to get a comfortable means of testing everything, you know, many times, okay? This is a bit the sketch of the exercise that we did. Later you will see results. And finally, second step for the logic, because we had the a priori expectation for each scenario, we said, okay, let's try to actually fly some of these, not on the laboratory, but simulating some real life uh, missions. And this we can fly, process and analyze the same way and compare the results that we got with the a priori expectation. This we could do. So we are, we've been doing some of these, we are, on the process of finalizing some of these, so um, this is part of the exercise, okay? So now you get the picture of the work that we've been doing or the logic behind the, the process. 
now we'll start a third, a third item here that I need to explain, need to introduce this in order for you guys to, to understand this if you're not familiar with this. Santi, you, you probably are familiar with this. So, so sorry for the... <laughs> you need to refresh. Good. So let me talk about some metrics. The metrics that we need to put in place to measure when we're talking about performance, right? So suppose, again, we have this situation. You have two waypoints. You have your flight path, the line you want to fly, okay? And you are here or you think you're here. This is what your navigation system is telling you, okay? Back to the slide I said before, this is the actual difference between what the autopilot is or where it's telling it is and the difference with the flight path. So the, the mission of the autopilot is to minimize this, okay? In aeronautical terms, navigation terms, this is what it's called flight technical error. It depends on the autopilot, on the type of drone, on the mission, as we said before. So FT in short. So from now on, I will be doing, I will be saying FT, okay? Flight technical error. There is a second one, now we know, which is the difference from what you, your navigation system is telling you and the truth, the actual truth. So basically, this is what we call the navigation system error. It just depends on the navigation equipment you have on board, the quality of it, okay? Um, uh, from these two, you get a third one, which is very easy. It's the sum of these two, which is called the total system error. So the total system error goes from the truth to the flight path. And this is the one that matters because it's the actual true difference from where you are to where you want to be, okay? And the total system error is the base of uh, another concept, which is called required navigation performance. Now, for those of you who are a lot into aviation, this sounds very familiar. And I have to say that in reality, we have taken bits of this or the, let's say, the relevant part of this to, you know, do the work that we wanted to do. I'm explaining now what I, what I mean. So note, so think that you have your TSC, your total uh, system error. You want to do something. You want to build a road centered in this flight path, extending some X meters on side to side. Here, there's just one side represented, okay? And what you want to do is a containment exercise. You want to know what is this X such that the 95% of the time you are inside here, okay? This is one condition that uh, goes into the RNP concept, okay? Let me repeat it again. We have a road. You want to know the 95% of the time uh, what is the X that will make the 95% of the time be inside this? But there is a second one. Extend this road, so build another road, now two times X. And let's ask this question, what is then the same X that would additionally make uh, the following statement? In case my total system error is further, is larger than this two times X, and I get no warning of any kind, the probability of this event shall be very small, 10 to the minus 4. The combination of these two statements is, makes what we define RMP. So the combination, we say, the statement is, the combination of a drone, a mission, and a navigation system, the three items, we say it's RMP X compliant if one and two hold, okay? Now we are diving a little bit on the mathematics, on the science of it, but I think it's clear or it should be clear from the side of what I said before or what I showed before, the sky roads. You know where you, you, you can define where you want to go with lines, but you additionally want to build some buffers and eventually you want to measure how well you're contained within these buffers. Okay, this is the natural idea behind RNP. So from now on, we will say, we will measure, reality is a project that measures RNP and now you know how we measure this RMP, okay? Um, there's two things here that please retain in the memory and they will come later. First of all, we're talking about warnings. So the second condition of RMP says that there should, there has to be a system that, that controls this and raises a warning, okay? So that's a fundamental uh, thing when you want to implement RMP in your drones. And secondly, the truth. This drone is a bit transparent and, and for a reason, because actually, actually, you never get the truth. You never know it. 
you just have to speculate about it or estimate where the truth is. Keep this idea in mind for later. Um, now, for those of you that know integrity and have learned now, maybe, sorry, uh, RMP, um, we actually took RMP as an extension of integrity. That's a good thing about it, okay? When you talk about integrity, you talk just about navigation. You just talk about NSE, the part that relates to navigation system. But that's not the full picture, okay? If you want to separate and uh, you know, be safe in terms of flight uh, operations, you need to have both. So integrity uh, indeed requires monitoring on board and it protects against navigation errors. But with RNP as an extension of integrity, we actually protect against deviations from the flight path and allow us in a very natural way to define uh, the requirements in spatial terms because RNP is, is linked to this X meters on the road. And this can be very intuitively uh, put into terms of saying, okay, I have this region available, so these are my X meters or two X meters. Um, let's define this RMP, you see? That's a more natural way we, we, we believe, and this is why we actually go for, for RMP. In reality, we have built a tool for RMP monitoring. You will see the results later. In order to replay, yes, let me finish. In order to just replay these flights, and study how compliant we are with RMPs. Herman, you have a question. question. The integrity then is in the previous slide, if you just take out the second condition, that would be just the integrity of the previous slide. That one, condition one. Condition, condition one. one uh, if I'm condition two, that would be integrity. No, no, actually, condition two is the integrity That's condition. Okay. It's integrity condition. Because, so the question was, I have to repeat the question because of my call. Question was, um, if we take here the second condition, uh, actually first condition would be the integrity one. And my answer is no, actually the second one is integrity one. Why? Because here, the fact of not getting a warning is what we call misdetection, right? So suppose you have a system that detects the whole thing, right? If you are uh, flying away from that. If you're not detecting this, if you get no warning, you're, mis, you're in a situation of misdetection. And integrity is precisely the, the management of misdetections, like how to deal with that and how good 10 to the minus four should be your system uh, uh, on dealing with these situations, okay? So actually the second one is the one, exactly. Thanks for the question, Herman. So, Python of integrity and RMP, what, how do we translate our scenarios on these RMPs, so the a priori uh, RMPs that we wanted to derive for these scenarios. We, we did this exercise. We consulted operators um, in these uh, areas and we basically did this exercise, which is also again very natural on saying, okay, for example, maritime surveillance. What are the requirements for separating my drone, which is flying open ocean, uh, with the rest? Well, apparently, <laughs> Not, not a lot of requirements. So I can be, I'm at a very low risk in this type of operations, okay? Maybe takeoff and landing, of course, of these platforms, we have a different scenario with a higher risk. Now I'm talking about risks uh, of each mission. Now, again, for five fighting, probably you don't have much risk. Again, you are using segregated areas, although we are going for integration. Um, segregated areas in where there is a fire and you know nobody can go in. So you have your helicopters there, you have your firefighting drone support. They are both coordinated, of course. It's not that you can fly over a helicopter randomly. Uh, but probably you also have risk on, if we think on that scenario of a drone, big drone, carrying water and dumping water, maybe you have some risk when approaching the ground or separating uh, when doing this task, okay? One of the, the ones that we think have more risk maybe is uh, package delivery, right? So operations that they go through a corridor, but the risk comes in the fact that we know that for this to be really efficient, we want these corridors to really squeeze uh, between, you know, in cities, within cities, in, in a panorama with more platforms, okay? So, um, especially the risk is at landing, at delivering, even if you touch the ground, even if you don't touch the ground, there is a moment where you are uh, getting close to somewhere where some people are, okay? So that, you know, implies more risk. And for urban mapping, 
actually we thinking on the missions that usually are done for urban mapping we say okay horizontally there is not a lot of risk i mean if you deviate a little bit from the plan going on the sides that's not really problematic the problem maybe comes vertically you don't want with a drone to exceed certain you know clearance uh, level you don't want also to exceed on the lower side some height because if especially you're mapping a city uh, that's not good okay so maybe here we have more risk on the vertical than on the horizontal okay all in all that served us this rationale behind uh, this this logic here uh, served us to put some numbers so these are just numbers for RMPs meters numbers of meters in which we say okay we will try to see if these operations uh, fit this type of RNP. So we will define the corridors X to X, we will do the exercise and see how good we fit within uh, these uh, numbers. There is a separation in there, you see in the flight phase, because we know it's different. So we define two flight phases, waypoint to waypoint. So once you are in the air, you know, executing the mission, which is different from ground approach. So the moment where you either take off or you are landing on a spot. Okay. In terms of risk, these two phases are, are different. Okay. Color coded, meaning that we think the green ones are feasible. We think the orange ones, maybe not that much. And there is a red spot there, number 10, because we feel that might also be challenging. Okay. So um, that's our, you know, a priori statement about what we think we can, we should do, we have to do. And um, yeah. So now I talked about a bunch of things. We are good on time. And maybe now it's time for uh, Pablo Aro to come and present a bit about the EU SPA. Okay? Sorry, sir. Just, uh, yeah, uh, Ernest. About yes. The figures, the previous figures. Yes. Where they were taken from? I mean, Num 37 meters. Right. Exactly. No, good question, Ernest. So where, where does this meter come from? Because they are very kind of a specific, okay? RMPs are actually stated usually in the aviation world in nautical miles, okay? And actually there was a project before reality, which was called Real, so reality a bit extends this project, uh, managed by Pildo, that they already started working with RMP for drones, okay? So up to a certain point, a Real project uh, validated some RMP figures, okay? And Actually, 37 meters correspond, I don't want to be wrong here, but it's 0 0.002 RMP in nautical miles, okay? Because that's a figure that was, I think, tested or rehearsed in real, so it was like the ending point for that. It's far below what aviation actually uh, offers here, Santi. I think that 0 0.3 is like the, the zero tightest. Three with helicopters. Zero 0.3 with helicopters is like the tightest RNP where you can adhere, stick to, okay? So in real, there was a first exercise of going to 002, that's the 37 meters. And what we wanted to do here is, actually you see that it's halving. So it's based on test, on test, on test. Go. It's a very good question, because this is the $1 million question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's just a question. Uh, uh, Yuspa has always asked about this value. Okay. What we did in real, uh, was to turn the question the other way around. Yeah. Let's see how far we can go yeah. and let's see whether this operationally is acceptable. Okay. So what Vera is saying is exactly that. We did first uh, an initial assessment how far we can go with this type of generic platform yes. and the performance from the systems we have today available because that's the other issue. Yeah. Uh, and based on that, in reality, we took these figures as a baseline. And what we did is try to validate this baseline. So, but that has been the one million dollar question for euros <laughs> uh, for the last, uh, let's say, five years. Okay. I want to know the requirements from the drone operations to know whether my techno system or Galileo will comply with these mission requirements. And nobody is able to tell you. Because first, as Vera said, in drone operations, we don't use integrity. If you talk to a drone operator, they will tell you, I use DGPS and 30K, and I assume my truck is a zero error. So, but this truth from the, from the navigation system, from the truth for them, is not existing. So, where we will integrate technos in there, and we know there will be an error, 
with an integrity value. Mm -hmm. Can we can we play with this, or we need to make it lower or bigger? That's the, but it's based on experimentation. Yeah, yeah. Right. exactly. And, and the, the, the whole thing is to push the limit to see, to see where, where you can reach, what you can reach. But the most important part is that <coughs> the conclusion is that if tomorrow these values are wrong, you will have somebody to play. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, uh, but, well, I think it's interesting that it's uh, a performance-based yes. uh, approach. Yeah. And this is exactly why we met, uh, we, we put our stuff together, because we did this first, um, this first uh, project that we presented later. We, we saw that there was more work to be done on experimentation, and this is where we combine all together to have more robust value, uh, which is the outcome of reality, which to me is a very, very useful outcome. Good. No, no. Good. This is a workshop. We were supposed to be doing this. Good. Yes. So, Pablo Aro um, will present the EUSPA, and I leave you the floor. Then, maybe Pablo we will <coughs> they will put you a micro so that way. By the way, the micros are because we are recording everything to put it later on as a webinar, and then we need to have the sound here and there. So. Sí, ¿se aguanta? Sí, ¿no? Sí, perfecto. Sí, sí, vale. Perfecto. Ok. Le da el control. Perfecto. Ok, so, um, eh, buen día. Eh, good morning, buenos días. Uh, my name is Pablo Aro. I work for the European Union Agency for the Space Program. Uh, it's the former GSA. So this is somehow um, an institutional presentation, but um, yeah, I think that during the Q&A session, uh, I will be happy to go into the technical details or mathematical assessment, uh, whatever you, you want to ask. So, well, the first um, slide is just to explain the transition between the former agency, the uh, DSA, the European DNSS agency that was just responsible for the two European GNSS um, programs or systems, EGNOS and Galileo. Uh, in May this year, the agency was given also responsibility for uh, other uh, European elements, uh, such as Copernicus, the European Earth Observation System, and also governmental satellite communication, GovSatcom. And so there you have the, the new uh, website eusparu.europa.eu, where you have updated information on the systems, on uh, business opportunities, uh, material for supporting uh, startups, or a lot of uh, current information. Uh, these are the, the key tasks. So we have the manager of the, uh, EGNOS Galileo GNSS also the agencies in charge of security of the system. You have the two uh, elements uh, for navigation, GovSatcon as well as Copernicus. And uh, the third element task is uh, to address the market and innovation activities. So in that um, area is where we connect the systems with uh, the demand from society for from applications. So, so, in particular, for instance, I am working for, for, for that area, connecting systems with uh, applications. Um, well, here you have the portfolio of uh, services offered by Galileo. We have uh, the open service, which is somehow equivalent to the GPS SPS. Uh, we have a new feature, which is the OS navigation message authentication, which is a additional service uh, in order to fight against spoofing. So we have a, a layer of authentication. Then we have the PRS, which is somehow equivalent to the uh, GPS PPS, the military service. So we have something oriented to for defense application encrypted. So we have a more robustness, more availability. Then we have within the the Galileo satellites are payload where we have transponders uh, for supporting the, it's a, the European contribution to COSPA SARSAT. So in case we have a, an, an alert of a beacon, ELT, in airplanes, a PIRF on um, ships or vessels, or a, a personal location beacon, 
uh, this signal in start broadcasting in 401406 megahertz. This signal is received by the Galileo satellites. It is it's not a navigation uh, element, it's uh, just a search and rescue payload. And this signal is broadcast back to the COSPA SARSAT ground infrastructure. So this person in distress is located and uh, help is uh, sent to, to rescue. So this is not a navigation element, this is a contribution to search and rescue. We have uh, new services which are being uh, currently under test and will be in service uh, very soon. This is the high accuracy service. It is a, it's based on PPP with a precise point uh, positioning and uh, provided we have a good visibility of satellites above the, the local horizon, the horizontal accuracy would be in the order of 20 centimeters. Uh, and this is uh, uh, for free, high accuracy. We have uh, this uh, authentication service, uh, which is uh, somehow an extension of the open service navigation message authentication, uh, providing further elements of uh, authentication. And finally, we have this emergency warning service, which is a service um, by which uh, Galileo satellite broadcast uh, a signal uh, that can be received, for instance, in, uh, in smartphones equipped with a Galileo receiver um, for in, in a given area, in case we have, for instance, an earthquake or um, something that requires a quick action by the, by the population. So this is the, the portfolio. In, in the case of drones, we are typically using the open service. Uh, we may use the high accuracy service. Uh, and, and of course, we, we are typically using these services in a multi-constellation, uh, multi-frequency scenario. Hello. Yes? One question. In the high accuracy services, in none of these services, there is no integrity provision. Exactly. This is just a PPP, so we have further corrections. And, um, but we don't have a warning in case something is out of control. This is something uh, now in, uh, under research to have uh, some means of integrity for, for users using these uh, corrections. Okay. So, um, yes, and for the open service, in, in principle, we don't have any integrity. We, we need a, a certain layer of integrity we may use uh, rain or rain of advanced rain or in the next uh, version of ECNOS we will have uh, ECNOS uh, as an um, uh, integrity layer for the Galileo Open, yes. And, and this is a very important topic. So we may have, have extremely high accuracy but there are certain applications where we, we need mm, this uh, warning that was explained by Pera previously in, in case, uh, for instance, we have uh, human lives uh, using or depending for, of, of this service, or we have uh, liability critical applications or some critical applications. This is essential. For instance, in aviation, uh, more important than accuracy is integrity, because we have human lives uh, landing uh, at an airport. So in case there is something that might be out of control, we need a warning and the pilot knows uh, what to do. Okay. So this is the portfolio of Galileo services. And as you all know, uh, we have the European SVAS system, which is uh, ECNOS. This is equivalent to the uh, US uh, WAS system or equivalent systems all around the world, which broadcasts uh, by means of geostationary satellites, uh, interoperable signal. So we have ECNOS in Europe, we have uh, SCDM in Russia, we have EMSAS in Japan, we have other systems around the world, um, or the WAS in the US. These are the services, we have the open service, this is typically uh, one that can be used in, in drone operations. We have the safety of life service, but this, in case of ECNOS, was uh, adjusted, adjusted to the requirements of civil aviation. So with GPS plus ECNOS broadcasting signals in L1 frequency band, 
um, airplanes duly equipped and flying within the service area, which is essentially Europe, um, can perform a, an approach with both horizontal and vertical guidance, equivalent to an ILS CAT-1 precision approach operation. Uh, well, I, I remember our first flight many years ago in Valencia, that was the first, and, and the equipment was prepared by Pildo in a project called Giant. Uh, it was the first flight in Europe with a commercial airplane. And it was flown in Valencia with, uh, well, within a consortium of projects, but the, the, all these elements were prepared by, by Santi. I remember him. In the, you didn't crash the aircraft. <laughs> yes, no, it was, you know, it, 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 it flew, it, and the pilot was impressed with the needles, uh, and, and we saw, we saw the, the runway just in, in front of us, so it, it, um, it, it worked. <laughs> just so, yeah. so, we were pioneers at that time. <laughs> okay, and this is uh, broadcasting the EGNOS corrections by, by internet, by other, other means. EGNOS, Galileo are um, components or European contributions to the positioning sensor GNSS, where we, we also have, of course, uh, GPS and other um, uh, satellite services. We, this is also very important, the combination of GNSS with other sensors such as inertial systems. Uh, we are also addressing how it works with, um, uh, for instance, the 5G uh, telephone um, network, um, other, other uh, um, elements for, for, to derive the position of, of the drone. But the, the core, the central element is with GNSS. Uh, here we you have well, a couple of websites uh, where you have a database of uh, sensors and uh, applications, so, so oriented to a specific um, applications you have how GNSS is used in the railway sectors and concerning drones, you have this in, under the, in the air. In the air, you have both um, manned aviation and also drones. So you have all the drones manufacturers that uh, uh, the drones are equipped with, um, with a Galileo or, or EGNOS uh, sensor. And here you have all yes, some um, um, competitions or resources for um, startups or companies addressing the, um, uh, the drone sector. Uh, well, here is just a, uh, an overview of the value of uh, GNSS or EGNOS and Galileo in particular for drone flight operations. We have an increased uh, availability. Well, in principle, we, if we, with respect to GPS only scenario, if we have a Galileo, we have additional branching sources, the satellites, we have uh, um, several frequencies, so uh, we, we have uh, an increased availability. For this, it's also very important um, since the, the drones may fly typically um, close to the ground, it's very important to, to design carefully the trajectory of, of the drone. So if we are close to the terrain, we may have um, higher masking angles, we may have a multipath, we, um, it's a much more difficult environment flying low uh, than uh, if we fly with, uh, with an airplane where we have very good visibility of all the satellites above the, the local horizon. But if we have other constellation, more frequencies, we have higher availability. Uh, the, the integrity is a, a central element uh, when we are addressing critical operations or when we fly beyond visual line of sight, we, we have a great dependence on, on, on the, the real reliability or on, on whether the signal, the positioning signal is valid for our flight operation. And in cases it is not, we need a central ele uh, uh, an element which is critical, which is the warning that was explained by Pera, the warning in case the positioning might not be valid for the current operation, and then we know, or we, we need to know the contingency action, okay? So, so if we have a red light, 
is to, to do something quickly. This is the, the, the value of the integrity mechanism. This is under uh, development. A significant amount of work ha has been done in this project in reality. Mm, well, there are still things to do, but I think that the project is in, in the right direction. This is a, a, a central element for, for EUSPA to, to address this um, integrity. We have uh, also with GNS, uh, with uh, Galileo EGNOS, we have uh, a higher accuracy. If, for instance, if we use uh, EGNOS corrections, uh, typically the horizontal accuracy is in the order of one meter, one, two meters. If we use the high accuracy service, we are in submeter accuracy. Provided we have good visibility of satellites in view, we, in case of EGNOS, we see the geostationary satellites, so we, there are a number of conditions. So when we see that these numbers, 20 centimeters, we have to read the, the details, so uh, under which conditions this is, this is correct. Okay. So accuracy and authentication, this is like a digital signature, so we are Mm, the, the, the signals are coming truly from Galileo satellites. This is a mechanism, a barrier to fight against, against spoofing. Okay. Uh, well, here we have some figures, uh, availability. So we have uh, not only GPS only, but typically mo most of the sensors equipped uh, in drones are uh, multi-constellation multi-frequency, so we have additional ranging sources. In case we are in a, in a urban corridor, we may have a huge number of satellites, but all, all the satellites are with a poor geometry. So um, the performance, the accuracy um, may be degraded. So, but the more satellites we have, it's, in principle, it's the better, of course. This is for, well, for accuracy. You have here some figures from the high Galileo High Accuracy Service and a number of um, applications. This uh, service, the, the PPP, is, it, is broadcast in the E6 band, and this is uh, outside the aeronautical radio navigation band. So I uh, think that for urban air mobility, for uh, in case we are carrying People, um, I, I, I think the, it should be um, addressed whether we can, f we can use something broadcasting in, in the E6 band. Okay, so. But in principle, high accuracy, we have submitter accuracy, which is um, very powerful for, for addressing um, these flight operations in, in, in demanding environments. Uh, well, integrity, as I said, the central element, and we, we will go into the details. This is, um, well, numbers that we have from civil aviation. So we have here the horizontal and vertical alert limits. This can be now as low as 35 meters for the vertical. This, we have the time to alert and the integrity risk, but this is taken from civil aviation. In fact, the design of FEGNOS was uh, the target was to support a flight operation equivalent to ILS CAT-1. This was the, the, the requirement. So these six seconds comes from ILS. This is an, an instrument approach, approach operation of an, of an airplane landing in an airport with horizontal and vertical guidance. So this, this comes from aviation. So the numbers, these of course, are not applicable at all for drone flight operation. This is something which is being addressed in this project, reality and, and other projects. So we, we need something, completely new numbers. In fact, I think that even the, the concept, the horizontal error limits, horizontal protection levels might not be valid for, for drone operations because this means that we have, mm, uh, so we have uh, an, an isotropic behavior uh, 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 for all the azimuths. And this, this works for, 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 um, for an airplane because you have somehow 
um, the same um, distribution of satellites to the north, to the east, to the south, which is not totally true, but you may assume that, it, that, that the satellites are evenly distributed. That's why we have horizontal alert limit for, for any direction, valid for any direction. So um, that's why it is a, a circular here. In case uh, we address the specific environment of a drones, this certain circle may be actually an, el an ellipse. And so we, 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 perhaps we, we need new, new, even a, a new concept. Uh, okay, so we, we, in the Q&A session, we may go into the details if, if um, this is a super important topic. This is authentication, as, uh, um, so um, a barrier against uh, spoofing. So in case, well, the, the, so the, the sensor knows that these signals come from through different from Galileo satellites. Okay. Um, okay. Be, uh, okay, and this is a, a new. Yes, time. So I, ha I have to speed up. Okay. So urban air mobility, this is an, uh, another project addressing in particular urban air mobility uh, with, 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 with people on board the drone and with uh, just uh, cargo drones flying uh, around the city. Um, this is an important um, application for, for drones uh, because we are flying in urban or suburban environments, so um, demanding scenarios. Uh, so where integrity is a central element because we have, it's a, the, the, the risk of a failure should be very, very low because the severity of a drone falling in a park is very, very high. So um, we, integrity is as, uh, essential for this. Pablo, just, just so you know, we have already done some flights in Benidorm between ah, high yeah. buildings. Yes. And we have, we have gathered a lot of raw data that we're now assessing, mm -hmm. similar to, to what we did in reality, but now inside the city with the high, the, the high buildings. Mm -hmm. uh, so we will let yes. you know the results when we have them. Okay, perfect. So well, another, so I have a couple of minutes or so. Okay, so to go, this is another, so two super important topics are integrity and the synergies with Copernicus, with Earth, Earth observation data. This uh, Copernicus has been uh, assigned to the agency, to EUSPA, uh, for the benefit of the society. So we are addressing in particular, um, we have a huge amount of data from the, from, from the satellite, from, from district services, for atmospheric data, so where this data is translated into the language of a specific application. So we have the, the land, the maritime, the atmospheric data. So this may be useful for drone flight operations. So it, we, we, are, we are thinking about this. Synergies with Copernicus, here you have some form more information on the value of uh, Copernicus data for, 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 for drone flight operations and for many other applications. Here you have well, the new program for research and development Horizon Europe and you have here some well, the budget and the, the topics in, in the, this year and uh, next year. You have all the details of this in the EUSPA website. And that's all. So um, I'm ready to go into the discussions. Uh, with, in particular on, around on Copernicus and, and integrity. Mm, thank you. Pablo, if you have any questions, maybe we have one minute. I, 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 do, I do have a question. Um, yes. Concerning the HAS, um, you talked about, and that's something which has been uh, repeatedly uh, being said by USPA, you talked about the fact that HAS is going to be not only strict on E6 signal, but via terrestrial means, probably internet. Um, we are part of this uh, <coughs> the current testing campaign, um, and we, we do think that um, the, the biggest potential for the has adoption in mass market is streaming via internet. Uh -huh. And then my question is, 
Is this going to be um, simultaneously, uh, the streaming on the E6 and streaming on the internet once the commissioning phase ends and, and, and has it operational? Or there's going to be a, a delay or a gap in between? The well, I assume it will be um, the same. Is that it is, should mimic what we, it's going on with ECNOS. We have open service, safety of life, and we have the EDAS, which is the same corrections, but uh, through internet. Uh, it might be some latency. Uh, no, I'm not talking about the latency. I'm talking about the start. The start ah, the yeah, when the services are are in yeah. are, are in service yeah, for. Well, well, this is going ah. to happen simultaneously. Ah, with, uh, I, I, I didn't I don't know, safe. but I take the action. I, I ask. I don't know when we, it will be uh, deployed. Okay. Have you checked the the, the, the website? Uh, yeah, that's, that's no, the, but I take the action, I ask, and I pr provide you with the answer, okay? Thank you. Perfect. Okay, thank you, Pere. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Matteo Natale. I am the Safety and Compliance Engineer for uh, EuroUSC Italia. We are an SME based and founded in Rome in uh, September 2014, so technically we're not a startup anymore. And we are part of a larger network comprised of uh, Euro USC Italia, Spain, Benelux and Africa UFC. Now we have uh, expertise in uh, regulatory compliance and uh, safety assessments in the aviation world, more specifically obviously in the sector of UAS. Um, that has also led us to create Samwise. So we are the creators of Samwise, which is an online tool that you can access uh, via the link on screen, onlinesora.com. Now, Samwise is uh, an online tool that guides drone operators uh, through a complete risk assessment following the specific operations risk assessment methodology, or SORA, that Pere has um, mentioned before. Um, now, the SORA is um, a risk assessment which is recommended by EASA, as acceptable means of compliance to Article 11 of uh, EU Regulation 947 of uh, 2019. So right now, if we want to fly in the EASA specific category, we have to submit to the authorities, to our national CAA, an uh, operational risk assessment, and EASA recommends SORA. So we have created Samwise, which guides an operator through all of the risk assessment and produces a complete report with, um, with the SORA assessment. This has obviously come in very handy with the reality uh, use cases. So a little bit more about us. We uh, provide consultancy in the aviation domain, as I said, and more specifically, obviously, in the drone sector. Uh, so we support operators for, obviously, risk assessments and obtaining approvals and certifications for their national, uh, from their national CAAs. We're also very involved in the rulemaking and the standardization world. So we support authorities in developing um, international requirements for UAS. Uh, for example, the Joint Authorities for Rulemaking on Unmanned Systems. We're in fact um, involved in uh, Working Group 6 of JARUS, which is in fact the working group that has developed the SORA methodology. Uh, we also support regulators to develop rules on UAS and aerodromes. We work a lot with EASA, ENAC, which is the Italian uh, CIA, and the State of Qatar. And then finally, we participate to several SDOs, so standard development organizations. We are part of um, Eurokai Working Group 105, ISO, ASTM, RTCA, uh, ASD STAN, and so on. We also provide training. Um, so uh, we provide training courses in the aeronautical uh, regulation sector and in the safety sector. More specifically, within uh, airworthiness requirements, drone regulations, and obviously also the SORA methodology, the specific operations risk assessment methodology. All of these training courses are held at the uh, JAA training organization, that is the uh, Joint Aviation Authorities training organization in Amsterdam. And then finally, as is the case today, we participate to a multitude of um, European R&D funded projects. So as for our contribution to this project, obviously we have expertise in the um, uh, safety sector. And so as Pere mentioned, we can't just pick up and fly with a, a three meter drone. There is a lot of planning to do. There's a concept of operations to, uh, to develop and there is a safety assessment to, to develop to ensure that each flight can be conducted safely. 
So we're involved mainly in Work Package 2000, which is the concept of operations and RMP, where our role is that of the uh, regulation input provider, safety assessment, and support to the development of the CONOPS. The output of this work package is the RPAS CONOPS, flight procedures, and safety assessment. So let's take a look at that. <coughs> so obviously, all of the flights that we've conducted uh, are beyond visual line of sight. Some actually um, fly over uh, populated environments. And obviously, if you're aware of the, um, of the um, current regulations, this makes, us, uh, this makes it so that we have to fly within the specific category. So all of the operations were conducted in the specific category, and this means we have to conduct an operational risk assessment and submit it to the national CAA uh, based on AMC1, AMC1, that is acceptable means of compliance 1, to Article 11 of EU Regulation 947. So we're flying in the specific category, we have to submit an operational risk assessment, and we have done so with the specific operations risk assessment methodology. So we have conducted a safety assessment and a CONOPS for each one of the, of the use cases that Pere has mentioned, maritime surveillance, firefighting support, freight transportation and urban mapping, all of which we have conducted with Samwise, obviously. Uh, finally, we're also uh, partaking in Work Package 5000, that is conclusions, recommendations and dissemination of the technical results yielded from the uh, missions that we have flown. Our role in this case is that of the RPS, RPAS regulations output provider and dissemination. So what we do in this case is transpose the reality technical results into their poten potential regulatory applications. So in this case we address the pre-identified regulatory agencies, for example EASA, and obviously also the standard development organizations to which we uh, partake. So this is exactly why we're here, to have a fruitful discussion, obtain the technical results that we need in order to divulgate and uh, disseminate to these uh, providers. Thank you. Great, Matteo. Thank you very much. Thank you. Remember that we have a meeting later to discuss about this exactly. <laughs> these things, taking advantage you're here. So this, this is the, the interesting part of how reality comes back with some conclusions to, uh, in this case, agencies. Okay, build the labs. Which, which Santi? Santi? Big Santi one, Big Santi. Uh, bueno, this is, this is a workshop. Uh, I'm Santiago Soleil, I'm the CEO of Build the Labs. My fight is always to, to workshop. You think about workshop, it's work to work, shop to buy something or to sell something. My fight, personal fight, is to not only be on the second part. So, to still do something useful, to work. But the real truth is that Santi and Josep have been the most people working on the project. But I'm the CEO and I need to do these things, to promote what we are doing, why we are doing that, and how we are doing that. So I will present who we are, what we have been supposed to be doing in the project. I will not give me so many details like work package. If this is a piece of information very important on the figures, you, you ask Santi. But I will tell you what, as, at least as CEO, what I was expecting from the project. But I, I would like to start from the beginning, the idea of this project was to combine this expertise. No? As you will read, we are experts on aviation, so what, what we are doing is trying to implement new technologies, uh, mostly from satellite, and people know us from satellite technologies, into operations. And we keep working with aircrafts. Then we start working with rotorcraft. And, and when we translate performance-based operations or implementing satellite nav navigation into rotorcraft from aircraft, it's not the same. It's completely different. So we need to reduce the performance. We need to manage the operations completely different. We don't fly exactly the same. And now there's a new thing coming, which is drones. And the people from drones, they don't know anything about aviation. So we need to combine these two worlds. And, and this is what the beauty of this project. We were, we were trying to combine different expertise from the system side, from demos, from very precise integrity algorithms, operational expertise, but at the end, what was behind is that today we are trying to integrate these things into an airspace that is populated by aircraft and rotorcraft, and this is not easy. So when we speak about integrity, most of the people from the drone's uh, environment, they don't understand a single word about that. So we need to, to educate, we need to really understand whether this information is really of interest for this, uh, for this sector, 
and we will need to build up around. But as it was presented by Pablo, we are left alone because uh, the current systems, Galileo, are not providing integrity. And this is why we have Ismael and, and Pera working on this Nexa and trying to build up this self-integrity. Okay? But this, this is PILDO. We are experts on implementing satellite navigation, among others, into aviation. We are procedure designers, so we are approved by the UK CAA. Uh, we have a Spanish CAA that doesn't understand what is to prove uh, uh, people for procedure design. So we went to the UK and we are approved to do this task. We can take the RMP and we can design procedures for people to fly safely. Okay? And this is why we were participating in the project. It is true that we were coming from a previous activity called Real, uh, already was mentioned by Pera. Real was a, a fair shot. We were trying to, to answer this uh, one million euros uh, question. And uh, what, what you need? Tell me the mission requirements documents. We are, we are always used to work on mission requirements documents. If we go to the people from ISA, they have this table, you keep them, and they will build up you a system that provides the mission requirements document. But here we have a system already. And uh, the mission requirements document from the drones, what the drones uh, uh, industry wants from this system was not in place. So then we need to turn around. Eh? Yeah. So what, what do you need? And I said, well, let me test and let me see how far I can go. Then let me see how far you can provide me the information and I try to fit in there. So this was real, which we participated with Falacatec. We, we integrate for the first time uh, uh, EGNOS in, in a drone. We designed a fair flight, flight procedure, and we did some tests in Atlas. No? But what we discovered is that when you take flight procedure, let's say, uh, exercise, and you put it into a drone, it's completely useless. Completely useless. So you, even if you adapt the performance from an aircraft to a drone, you will see the drone remaining at 500 meters. You don't see the drone. It's very small. And then you need to start a visual approach. Say, well, that doesn't work. Okay? That, that was the the starting point. The Italians are still there, enough, huh? in, Grot in Grotalle. They done one month ago a demonstration from an LPV with a drone. We did that three years ago, completely useless. Okay? So we need to adapt the flight procedure design to the drones. Huh? It's a completely different thing. And then you will need to adapt the avionics to understand this new language. Huh? Uh, this. So that's why we wanted to work on reality. We did the first test. But still, we have some flavors on how far we would need to go on the performance. But we need to experiment more. We still don't know. Eh? And if you see drones, how many drones are in the market? There are many platforms. Everybody builds up new platforms. Steel rotors, multi-rotors, fixed wing. How are these machines flying? Aerodynamics, completely different. So we need to, we need to collect more data. We need to still understand what is the actual requirement from these people to provide a safe operation? It doesn't matter if you fly in Cochuspina, you will see we will get around. There's no, no problem eh? in Cochuspina. Segregated airspace, there are segregated airspace. Eh? But if we want to integrate that with Rotorcraft, we need to know where these things will be. We need to really build up this surface to protect the flight. We need to really build up these corridors and we need to be sure that they will be there, because otherwise we will have a problem. And if this is not there, the drones will not fly. That's the end of the history. Yeah? And the people in AIRE, ATM, everybody says, you will need to adapt on what I'm doing. I will not adapt myself on what you want to do. And this is the truth, and this is how it's going to be. So we need to start working with RMP. When we sit down the first time, Epera, so what's RMP? <laughs> So that was a very nice dialogue, Ismail, you remember that. Eh? And that's been reality. There are other things. There are the use spacers. Uh, there are people building up um, uh, applications to, to integrate you into their space. And when you say, but, but how you integrate a drone into their space? How you define, how you define the segregated space? Oh, more or less, I, I build up a, a cycle. You build up a cycle, OK. That's trace. We, we are just on the time to let you know where I am. Remote ID. Eh? We want to know where a drone it is. But we still don't know how we will manage this information. Eh? We, are, we are at the beginning. Eh? We, we need to know where, where you are. Then we go to Tinder. Tinder is, uh, I, I know where you are, and now I will do tactical deconfliction. Eh? 
if I see that something is going wrong, I will define a, a new route to separate traffic. And how you are going to do that? Oh, we don't know. How far in advance? Eh? Do we need to do that uh, a waypoint one mile before? No, sorry, because the drones work in meters. So, sorry, 100 meters before? Uh, I, I don't know. It will depend on the speed eh, of the platform. But which platform are you flying? It's a, a city Airbus, is a, the Onyx, Oryx, eh? is oof, tactical confliction. Lots of money put in there. Eh? Cesar doing demonstrations. We are just at the beginning. We need to really first know what the type of performance we can maintain. And then we will, we will separate traffic, we will do everything. But then, no, no, we just don't want to fly on Colchuspina. We also want to fly in the center of Benidorm. I will deliver you my pizza, your pizza, you will call it, and I will deliver your pizza in the center of Benidorm, into your, your uh, <coughs> patio. Ah, but if we go to the Ismail, you're an expert, eh? the E6, if we, or triple frequency. If we go to an urban environment, multipath and so on, oof, multipath. GNSS, multipath, uh, interference, okay, DeLorean. Let's gonna see what are the main challenge we will face when we go to the urban environment. So there's a long, long way to, to, to go. And it looks like tomorrow we'll have the drones uh, flying. And then the CBU UAVs from Galicia. We need to improve the public services through drones. I already presented that. We are experts on doing this. For most of the people that are not coming from aviation, when you fly an aircraft, there is always something designed. We need to protect you. If we have an aircraft, we need to be sure that when you will approach an airport, there will not be obstacles in the middle, whatever that happens. If we have a position from a navigation system but it's, it's deviating, this truth is bigger, we'll, you will be always protected by 10 to the minus 7 in aviation, meaning one second in 100 years that will happen. If you are there, bad luck for you. But one second in 100 years, you will have one failure on not protecting you from the navigation position. So we work on translating that into the drones. As I mentioned, the drones doesn't fly exactly like an aircraft, so we know that they, they follow uh, waypoint to waypoint. We invent a nice concept, which is the donkey algorithm yeah, the, with the, the carrot. And then we wanted to translate this RMPs on something useful that a drone can fly. And what we did is to build up this machine. This machine is the the RNU, I thought that was coming from radio navigation unit, but you said, Tommy, no, no, it's reality navigation unit. Okay, sorry. So this is a reality navigation unit where we integrate all the data that uh, Genomerics needed to work with this uh, Nexa and to really do all the, all the assessments on, on the performance. So the idea for us, it's been a, a very good opportunity to embark this unit in two let's say, generic platforms, uh, generic platforms, a fixed wing and multi-copter. And for us, has been a very good opportunity to develop all the, uh, let's say, assets we will need to do to characterize, to characterize at RMP level how we need to protect these, these flights. Because if we are not able to protect this, you will never fly that in a non-segregated airspace. You will fly in cold suspina, you will fly in segregated airspace, but in a non-segregated airspace, you will never be able to do it. Okay. And now it's the time for Kaju Ibis. First of all, thank you all for coming. Welcome again to our test site. So just to clarify who we are, uh, the company is called Kaju AV. That is the name that you've seen during all the presentation. Kaju AV is one of the oldest uh, drone civil companies in Europe. We started working with drones in year 2000 and started providing commercial services in 2003. So from the experience that we're gaining during all those time, we created in 2014 the test site in which we are today here. Uh, foreseeing the, the needs that you have seen until now, this needs to test things in a safe environment and to keep developing all UAV technology, UAV standards, UAV procedures, 
in order to safely deploy this technology later on in the market. So you can understand BC Entron Center as the safe place to come when you are developing this technology. Uh, we have uh, experience in multiple projects more related both with uh, development of drone technology, uh, like the first one that you are seeing here, or our drone. We have some of them focused on the application side. We have been pioneers in multiple applications, like for example, the mining applications here in Bosnia, uh, maritime applications. We were one of the first companies to fly drones in emergency. We fly already drones for the Lorca earthquake in 2011. So we always try to be on the uh, cutting edge applications or in the more advanced UAV developments in order to, to keep evolving our technologies. So our role here in this project has been more or less quite straightforward as it was to integrate the RNU developed by PILO in our drones. We use it two different drones here. One is the Oryx, the one that you hopefully will see later on in flight. And the other one was a typical uh, exarotor uh, in order to simulate these two different behaviors uh, that we have. One is the multirotor that can stop in the air, hover, uh, fly more precisely as we will see. And there are a big fixed wing, like the ones that with the new uh, standard category I stand at the specific category in the new legislation will become available for long range applications, long endurance applications, uh, delivery, and that will end up with drone taxis and this type of high risk applications. In order to deal with that, we have taken advantage, as already Santi has told you, of this segregated airspace that we have here. So we can fly with the knowledge of nobody will be flying there. So the air risk is low. And also we are in a quite unpopulated area, as you've already seen. So here we can only harm some cows that we have nearby, but no one else. So also we have a really low risk in the ground. And thanks to that, we can deploy these more complex application setups that outside uh, some of these Facilities will be more complex, especially for legal uh, requirements. Well, I don't want to lose so much time. All this information is in the web, but you here have the features of our certified airspace. This, in fact, is the old one. Now we have it uh, increased it. It has doubled the size. Uh, here we can fly at higher altitudes than normal, and also uh, uh, we perform beyond visual line of sight, and it's easier to get an uh, operational authorization to flight here in these conditions because of these low risks that I have explained. So uh, what we've made is these more than 100 flights, intensive flights. They were performed using the same pattern that you are seeing here. These were the patterns that we were uh, using. And totally, uh, these are the two drones that I commented. So one is the, fi one is the fixed wing, the Oryx system, that can fly up to uh, 26 hours, depending on the payload, of course. And the multirotor, we can fly up to 30 minutes. Here you can see the images of both of them. And here is, again, the same information. And in order to perform these flights, uh, you can see here the different uh, patterns that we prepared. One is the linear pattern that you can see here for the multirotor and here for the fixed wing. And the other one is the scanning pattern for the multirotor and the fixed wing. Both of them were intended to represent or simulate uh, to different, the different types of applications that we've seen. So this type of long flight legs represent this uh, delivery applications, long range surveillance in which you take off from an airfield, then go to the place in there is 
maybe an emergency or the place that you want to surveil. For example, you take off here from our test site, but then we go to Montserrat in order to surveil a, fi a fire. So then we have this long straight flights, a long corridor, and then probably we have some operation here and then a comeback to the area. And the other uh, common flight path is the typical mapping or photogrammetic flight plan in which we perform these parallel flight legs. So uh, we can get pictures or data or a scan a certain area. In these cases, usually we have an area of interest in which we want to get some data and then we repetitively fly over there in order to ensure that we get all the area covered. So these flights were repeated multiple times and also uh, with multiple configurations and setups. We had three configurations for each one of the drones, uh, the slow, the standard and the fast. With the slow configuration, we fly the systems at lower speeds, the fast at faster speeds, but also we made the, uh, the planning characteristics more or less uh, big. So for example, in the slow uh, standard, we allow for more room for the drone to make the turns. We use it as uh, lower angle. So the system was flying in a slower way, but also in a more flexible way, we can say in the fast uh, procedures, we were flying faster, but also asking to make the turns more aggressive and, uh, and making them uh, be, be faster. And the standard was something in between of them. And also we tried to fly at different uh, times of the year. So we had different temperature conditions, different wind conditions. Uh, as you can see, always trying to be uh, at some safe levels as we need to perform a lot of flights. Uh, we try to fly always beyond, uh, you know, lower than a wind of 15 kilometers per hour. So in total, the intensive flights uh, that we're taking were uh, 111 that were used to generate the results that later on I will show you. And here you have some more photos of this setup. You can see here the RNU on board the Oryx or here on board the multi-rotor and here the system's flying. After performing these intensive flights, we moved to our case scenario that was this uh, simulation of urban scenario. It's not mm, properly urban, it's an uh, urbanization that we have nearby here. So it's mm, dispersed houses as you can see. But at the end we simulated here a mapping mission. Here is the real flight fly path performed and done with the Oryx. So you can see here all the flight legs that were used in order to generate this orthophoto map. Uh, it was a 300 hectares uh, orthophoto map that was covered in less than 30 minutes. And well, here you have the data about the number of image and the final resolution. And I think that is everything from my part. And maybe there are no more questions. No, know if we can have to go fast. <laughs> yeah, maybe one minute questions or otherwise. Does anybody have a question? Either for Jordi, for Matteo, we've seen presentations all over. If not, the plan is to assess how we good. Okay, <laughs> that's good. Yeah. We're good. So we go outside and see the flight and then we'll come back with some more. The work we've been doing, we saw one of the platforms used for these famous 100 flights, the Oryx, okay? And now, second part, more technical results, diving into navigation. And before that, one more partner, Maria Jose from Catec, explaining what they did. So maybe just we go straight for that. Thank you, Pere. <laughs> so now I'm going to present both Catec and Aurora in the project. Um, when you hear uh, talk about Catec, uh, you can find three different lines. That's our Fala, Catec, and Arlat. 
FADA is an Andalusia Foundation for the Respect Development, that is the cor corporative entity that manages Katak and Atlas. Katak is a technological center um, located in the south of Spain, in Seville, and is where we develop our main activity. And Arla is at Experimental Fly Center. Vale, José, ¿quieres igual quitarte como quieras? Sí, eh? sí. Es que se entiende mejor, sí. Sí, sí, me escucha mejor. Eh, we in Qatar, we have a high expertise in the development of drone technologies. Right now we have more of 25 engineers working in the development of this type of technologies. Um, we are very active in the participation in E&D projects. Uh, right now we have uh, around 40, 40 um, European projects uh, in call has uh, H2020 or CESAR related with the development of U.S. technologies. We are also participating in several uh, national projects and we have a close link with the main entity for the sector in, the, in Spain. We have uh, really quality facilities for the development of this type of technologies um, in particular, for reality project, we wa want to highlight the Atlas. Atlas is a ta 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 test flight center that is located in Jaén. Um, we ha have there a temporary segregated air airspace that does allow the operation beyond the line. So, in, in our facilities, we have um, uh, all the communication systems necessary to operate uh, drones and uh, also Angara building to help um, all the integration and software development that's necessary for the development of a project or also help meeting and, and events. Um, in reality, we have participated in the work package in the project scenario related with the pack package delivery. As uh, Pere uh, mentioned before, we have um, participated in, in the following tasks. First of all, we um, made integration in the drone plan of, of the RNU uh, system in the platform. We choose a, ma a drone uh, Matrix 600 Pro. Uh, we made the necessary modification for the, his integration. We also define um, the mission planning and the control algorithm to perform the flight experiment, and we perform that in, Al in Atlas. So, what was the mission defined? We define um, a mission um, from Atlas to an early hotel in, uh, in the rural. Um, environment, um, we, we perform the flight in beyond the line condition, taking the position data from the NU. In this slide, you can see the control architecture at hard level, how we cal calculate the waypoints from the data from the NU, the velocity, uh, the module when we see the order to the, to the drone platform. So, um, so then we finally we perform the, um, the fly experiments. Uh, we also manage the the manage the flight permit for uh, the, the, for perform the mission. We complete six, six flights back and forth, including the take off landing. And we obtain a very good uh, results. So. This is our role in the project. Thank you for your attention. Uh, with any questions? Thank, Thank you. you, Maria Jose. So, any questions for Catec? So you see that um, you see that was one of the uh, missions that we did. It was a special one because this one was flown with our software running. On the uh, in real time on RNU from Pildo and connected to the autopilot. So everything we flew here was done, you know, making sure or done with our algorithms, so GPS, EGNOS, real time navigation, and we did this. So I'm going to show you, well, now we start the block 
related to navigation and integrity. So it's, it was good to have uh, Katek uh, speaking first because essentially we are in a GNSS project, right? This is EUSPA and we have to talk about GNSS and what we get about this. And here in reality, we do two things, orientating, orientating this you know, to the present and to what can be in the future. So in the present, the focus of our project was GPS and ECNOS, which is what you can get for the 99% of the platforms. I'm, I'm specifying this because there's other projects from EUSFA focusing on other types of navigation. For example, mixing GPS and Galileo uh, as one of the main sources. So here we're focused on, on the navigation with ECNOS and these three, four spec meters that we got in there. Focus on RMP analysis. I introduced RMP before, and this is our metric. This is the metric we want to, to measure. We had intensive flights. Intensive flights are the ones done here that were done in the VCN drone center by flying a lot of times the patterns and some special scenarios, S3, uh, package delivery and S4, urban mapping that was introduced by Jordi before, in which the RNU, the same box was also there, okay? Um, and we did this one mission in real time navigation, which is the scenario three. So that's the task. Uh, for genomics, so now I'm changing hats and I'm more on the technical side. But there's also the future one. We, we were interested on saying, on, on checking how the future in navigation would look like and how this would help drones if it would help it. So Deimos uh, will talk about uh, the uses here of several constellations and several frequencies and also the next versions of ECNOS. ECNOS as a program itself is evolving. We are currently in version two. We will go for version three, right? And uh, we did then simulation scenarios plus one based on one of the operational scenarios in reality. But Pedro, you will, you will talk about this. So our approach to RMP assessment, what tools do we have in here? Uh, Santi has talked about this wonderful box here, uh, which contains everything we need. It contains one receiver drone alike. So the one you guys will have in your platforms. So basically based on GPS EGNOS, L1 frequency, so single frequency. But we also have another receiver in the box, which is multi-GNSS, double frequency, and we can use this in a PPK mode to extract the best trajectory you can get. We also connect to the autopilot log, so we have the, the, we have the let's say, the speech of the autopilot while operating, everything is locked and this we will need it, you will see. And we have other, uh, we had other sensors collecting data, which, you know, we plan to study how we can merge this and, and also for further, further work. Now, uh, in Genomerics, we use a tool developed by us called Nexa. Nexa is a navigator software for multi-sensor navigation. It works both, uh, both post-processing and online, okay? Uh, it was the main tool used to get the trajectories we were interested in getting two trajectories. First, what we call the study trajectory, the one that we want to analyze because it's the one representing the drones from the majority. But then, as I said before, we got an, as another one, which is the reference trajectory. The truth, okay? I'm always saying the truth there. So the truth, we get it here. We can, with this box, we are able to have a truth or the closest we can have to a truth. Um, why for, why getting this? Well, we, developed a third tool, which we call the RMP monitor, which is the actual tool that measures the compliance, okay, based on our trajectories. Um, first thing to measure is the NSC. I introduce later how to do that. So it's the difference between where you think you are and where you are actually, okay? So these two guys, you make the difference, you get the NSC, okay? This is why we needed the truth. If we wanted to make and measure RMP, we needed to have this reference trajectory, okay? And there's a second thing we get, which is the FTE. Uh, one question at this point. Yes, yes. Well, let's take up to you. What um, multi-GNSS uh, receiver is embedded in your... In, in here? Yeah. The model, you mean? Yeah, uh, the chipset. We have a Ublox M8 N4 for, for this one. No, the multi... The multi we have a Septentrio Asterix okay. receiver with a double frequency antenna. Okay. So NSE, good, good question. And then FTE, 
which was the difference from where you think you are to the actual plan. And this is why we need the autopilot log. Because this log is very important because it tells, you can, you can guess when the autopilot is sequencing the waypoints. So when it's saying, okay, I'm going to this one, and now I'm going to the other one. In this way, you can reconstruct over time the interpretation of the autopilot, which is necessary to get the FTE, because you have to know at what segment you're flying every time, okay? And you compare this not to the reference, but to the study one where you think you are, okay? So with these two guys, uh, you get the TSE, we know how to do that, and you know this tool, what does is extracting the X, such that the RMP X is compliant. There's another interesting thing, though, that this piece is doing, which is computing the NSE based on integrity, okay? And now let me, let me go a bit on the details for that. So again, same situation before, you got the flight path, you got your navigation system where you are, and this truth, which is actually unknown. In the RNU, it's known we are approximating this with a reference trajectory. But if I ask you guys, drone operators, do you have septentrio receivers, thousand, thousand euros or several thousand euros in, in your platforms? The answer is no, clearly. So you cannot access to this. So this is unknown. So what do we do? Are we saying that then we cannot benefit from RMPs with usual drones? Uh, well, that's not uh, what we're saying, because what we can do is develop a concept for protection areas. So the idea is telling you, instead of the NSE, telling you, look, in this region, the NSE is contained in this region with a certain level of probability, right? That's the closest thing, the closest approach we can do to approximate NSE, right? Here I'm talking about, or I'm putting this name, drone protection level. Protection level is a concept for very much used in navigation and I'm adding the drone to specify that this will be tailored for drones, okay? Again, just as like the NSC, this you can get it out of the navigation system, okay? It shall be built on the available measurements, so it really depends on the satellites you are observing at that moment, okay? The geometry you have for those satellites and the error model, so at the end, the quality of the measurements you are using, okay? This is not new, this is something that it's been done within navigation integrity and actually get two flavors for that currently. You got what you, what you call satellite-based augmentation system, SBAS, and actually EGNOS is one of these. Basically, I deploy a network of stations over some territory, I collect corrections, and I send those corrections to the users, okay? This is what is called SBAS, okay? The problem or the feature of these systems is that they correct um, what they say, the space, whatever belongs to the, uh, to the air segment. So errors related to the constellation of satellites. But if on your side, on the user side, you get some error, these uh, SBAS systems are not uh, able to correct for those, okay? For that, you got other schemes, such as RAIM. RAIM is Receiver Autonomous Integrity Monitoring, which is basically a similar, um, a similar concept, so putting in place algorithms to clean your data, but at the local level. It's not that somebody's doing that for you in some you know, network stations, but you do it on your own, okay? Um, these are the two flavors you get for, for integrity. And what we thought on reality, on building these DPLs and how they should look like, we said, okay, we, we need to assess, we need to address any error, also at the local level, because otherwise, um, you know, we cannot, we cannot assume we will always fly in good conditions with open air and so, and we need to really take care or assume there will be always errors at some point, okay? Um, I'm saving all the mathematics that are behind this, which there are quite few, but we are planning on putting this into publication and further develop this. So uh, I'm just uh, highlighting the, the, the high level things. And our approach is the following. So first thing you need to do to put this in place is first detecting if there are measurements, so satellite measurements that are wrong, that are faulty. And you need, to do the, you need to know if there are some, and if they are, exclude them. Do not account for this when you do navigation, okay? For this, we want to explore techniques such as sequential change detection. And please note, and that's related to one other slide I introduced 
red circle saying warning or not warning. Whenever you have a mechanism for detection, you are bound to making false alarms or misdetections, always, because you are trying to detect something and you will be that good at it. So you can have false alarms or you can have misdetections. This is important because actually you can tune your algorithms to be more aggressive, less aggressive. And how aggressive you have to be, that's again another million euro question. Um, the idea is to break down all the requirements from safety to finally say, okay, how aggressive do I have to be when detecting and excluding faults? Okay, that's a central part of it. We are working on it. Um, in any case, as I said before, your mindset now is, it's not that if I have errors or not, you have to assume you will have them. The question is, which is the size of the errors I can detect and clean? And then assuming that there will be errors below this, that they will be there and I cannot clean. Okay, that's an, it's a different mindset. It's not I'm wrong or right, it's, it's I'm wrong all the time, but how much, how wrong am I? Okay, so for any error that it's not detected, this region should be the region that expresses the maximum impact of those, okay? So first step is cleaning data, and once you have cleaned your data and it's not really clean, computing what is the impact of this remaining data, of these remaining uh, um, uh, errors, okay? This would lead to such type of regions, which for example in the horizontal plane they can be expressed as ellipses, and you can tune, as I said before, the level of reliability for this region, so you can express it to the 95% level, to the a bunch of nines percent here, uh, and this is actually and obviously linked to the RMP specification, okay, 95% and 10 to the minus 4. Um, and at the end, the RMP monitor, it's like a bubble in the road scheme. I don't know if you know this, this game, so when you go to the permit, to the driver license exam, and you have to, you know, stay within the road, so it's a kind of the same exercise. You have your road defined by RMP, you have a bubble, not a point, but a bubble, a protection bubble, and what you want is to keep this on the road all the time. This is the monitor. This is how the RMP monitor works, okay? So checking the RMP uh, conditions. Just a thing, the mathematical exercise of finding how or where a, a straight segment touches an ellipse is a difficult problem. It can be very complex. But we use an algorithm that's called the point polar algorithm that basically makes the thing upside down and to put it in simple, it simplifies the calculation. So this is a bit of innovation we are putting in, in such a RMP monitor. I know it's not super clear, so this is why I prepared this, which is a bit of an animation to show you, hopefully, how it works. I stop the video here. This is how the RMP monitor works, okay? You have to imagine that there is a map underlying this. It's just widescreen, but anyways. We have the study position in the center. You have a first bubble, which is the 95 ellipse, okay? And then you have a bigger bubble, which is scaled to another level. So say 99, some nines, okay? You see two lines, which from my perspective, they actually do not look parallel, hopefully they look parallel to you. So, okay, so you have to imagine a straight segment in the middle, it, it will come later, and this is the X road, the first road. This one is the two X road, okay? So the mechanism is to replay flights and see if that flight that you've flown with that drone, with that procedure, with that navigation system, will comply with RMP, okay? And this is a bit of the animation that we do in which you see the position or several positions of the drone. This is an actual flight. This actually is a flight from Catec. So flying a straight segment, computing the horizon, the, sorry, the DPLs, the protection levels, and see if they fit some region, okay? It is just a short animation to, uh, so that you visualize what we've done here. Clear? Just an example, okay? We are, keep, uh, we are working on it, we have many flights to replay and many results to extract. But we have some already, and this is why I'm getting back here 
and starting with the thing. So now a lot of figures, no more text, I swear. Yeah. And uh, can you yep. Say a couple of words for sure. People that are not experienced on procedural design task, you've seen the video how the two uh, links together. Yeah. And in the turn, you've seen that it's different. It's difficult to to keep the bottom, no? This you is see for, more of exactly. So this is, for example, where we design the what we call the wind speed. Up, that we need to take into account how the speed from the aircraft or the drone will have this inertia to protect the tone. And this is what we, we are learning with, with these flights also from our Let me catch you here, Sandy, because it's about that now. Okay? So this is the linear flight, and this is an actual trajectory computed by Nexa uh, for the fixed wing, for the Oryx. Okay? If you compare those, you already see some differences, right? But in any case, the RMP monitor is there for, to analyze the differences. So, um, one, for example, this is a bunch of errors that we get. We get the, the flight technical error, vertical error. Don't, I will not go to the slide, but basically this is navigation. And the big ones are FTE. So how much the autopilot is deviating from the flight plan. This is the bigger error that we're having for this type of platforms. So the RMP monitor delivers errors over time, statistics, and actually errors along trajectory. So here you see colorized the same trajectory and the areas with a lighter um, color is where you have largest RMP error, okay? You see especially some areas which are the turns and if I zoom in that and I put the flight plan on top of that, you see what exactly what Santi was mentioning now. We are defining flight plans which are super straight. Um, but the drone will never do that. Um, ideally, you would have, you would go for the tangents, but you might not even get that. So you might get some bit of a flyover. So here the error increases, you get it back down. Next waypoint, you fly over and back again. This is not, this is fine. This is fine. This is the behavior we get. You, you just need to be conscious of that. You just need to rethink how you are, you are thinking your plans or reshaping the plans with new procedures, which was what, what Santi was introducing, okay? But this is fine. You just need to measure it and know that it's there, okay? So that, that's the tool, this is what the tool is for. Um, I will not go into to these numbers just to scare you a little bit. Um, these are all the statistics out of the more than 100 flights for RNP, okay? But they are grouped. So there's not 100 statistics here, but there are groups. Grouped by type of flight, linear scanning, the two patterns. Type of drone, this is the Oryx, this is the Taro, so this is fixed wing and uh, rotary wing. And by configuration, Jordi Salvador was introducing the different configurations in the flight. So basically variation of speed, variation of waypoint radius, and variation of speed rate also. You will see that, how it affects. So for all of these, you know, for each cell, we have like a bunch of flights, and with a bunch of flights, you can take statistics, okay? The mean and variation for that, the median actually, horizontal and vertical. Let me put this table in a better way so that you understand it. So let's go for RNP horizontal. So now we're focusing on the horizontal errors. On the left side, you have the fixed wing. On the right side, sorry, on the left side, sorry, on the left side, you have the linear flights. On the right side you have the scanning flights. On the blue you have the fixed wing. On the orange you have the multicopter, okay? <coughs> and each dot you see here, that's the median value and that's the variation for that group of flights. So we have say eight, nine, ten flights for that configuration. Here you see the configuration, so high speed, medium speed, low speed, to make it, you know, rough terms. And this is the statistics. Some conclusions. The slower we fly, the better we perform. Okay? That's something that is pretty obvious from here. That's the, the obvious conclu <laughs> conclusion. The second one is not obvious. Flying um, with a fixed drone, the linear pattern is more difficult than flying the scanning pattern because these values are lower than those. And this is normal again because the procedure is tighter for the Oryx. The procedure of the scanning was this set of 
lines which were very close, you make it, you, you have to make the turn, sharp turns, etc. So that was tighter uh, for, the, for the Oryx, and this is what you see in the numbers. Third conclusion is not here, but it's obvious. Multi rotors fly a different way. You know, you go to the point, stop, continue, so you have lesser errors than the fixed wing, you know, it has to stay there in the air all the time. Same thing, but for vertical now, vertical errors, okay? Um, that's actually inverted, the tendency. So the lower we fly, the more error we got. And that's because we, uh, well, first of all, sorry, first of all, you see the same ranges of errors here. So in the vertical, there's not such a difference between the scanning and the linear pattern. But second thing is that flying lower increases the error. And that's, that doesn't really have to do with speed, but with speed rate. Uh, in low configurations, what we did was also tighten the amount of speed we changed. So basically the acceleration on the vertical. Um, then the drone, you know, it's, it's more difficult for the drone in lower configurations to actually follow the plan, especially in the vertical when there is a change of height, right? So normal, but that leads us to something that we discussed with Katy Jovi at some time, which is, does this have to do maybe with the engine type? So do we, is this a variable again? If I'm flying electric or I'm flying uh, fuel, behavior is different. The, the way we approach to the, to the segments, the way we recover, you know, inertia, etc. Is this a parameter of interest also for RMP? So you see a lot of open questions, but we are in a workshop, so this is why. <coughs> so basically, we have some more results, but I, I thought those were the interesting ones. We have, for example, correlations. Okay, let, let me get back. We have correlations with these results with, for example, wind. Um, there, was, there was a variation of wind. Uh, Jordi showed up to 10 meters per second, something like this. Uh, but we didn't see an actual impact on the flights. Again, for those drones, for those flights, for you know, that we did, uh, there was not cor no not a not a huge correlation, let's say, on the on the wind. Although we know that if we would have gone higher, probably that would have an impact. But we weren't able to measure. And um, yeah, and we have some other side results, but it's not worthy. So let's go to that scenario. Maria Jose introduced this mission, flying from Atlas. Actually, we put, we put a box in there to you know, make the thing, package delivery. And then we flew here to an hotel. We did the landing and, and back, okay? So we tried to repeat this mission. This is the one that we flew with, uh, with our Nexa, okay? Now I'm going to show you something at this. Uh, well, again, for the RMP monitor, this is the trajectory in horizontal and in vertical. Here you see a takeoff. We do uh, the thing, this is actually cut, there was a bit on the beginning, but anyway, uh, we descend it at the hotel and get him back, okay? Um, again, the statistics, type of statistics you can get with the, with the uh, RNP monitor. What I wanted to show you is this, which is very preliminary, okay? So I said at the beginning that one goal of the project is to have a priori expect expectations and then to fly and see how much we can fit with us. Um, for the a priori expectations for that flight, we were remaining on the 18 meters, which was half of the uh, 002 <coughs> mile that we stated in there. What I'm showing here is, for example, the achieved, FT, the achieved total system error, okay? Um, and I'm here, I'm stating direct NSE, meaning that I'm using the truth. I'm using the truth to compute the NSE. So NSE with the truth, with the reference trajectory, plus the FTE. When you do that, performance is very good. I mean, with this platform, with that speed, that type of pattern, etc., we get this very good performance. It's almost at the limit of, you know, the ECNOS real performance, so almost no FTE, okay? This result, it's actually the same, but instead of using the NSC with the reference trajectory, I'm using an ellipse, okay, a 95% ellipse. And then the compliance is worse or we have to inflate the specification. This is normal because when you, when you do this uh, region that shall contain the actual trajectory, you are losing, you're being conservative, right? So you're losing space. So that bubble 
for sure contains, or 95% sure that contains the actual uh, uh, position, but you might you know, need some space to allocate it. This is typical also from protection levels in, in, in SBAS or in RAIN, where you segregate bigger areas than actually you, you have to. The other two results are a bit of experimentation with the integrity ellipse. So now I'm talking about putting a larger ellipse, but not protecting to 95%, but protecting to higher levels. So here are two examples of, uh, let's say, the, the error, the risk that I'm allowing, 2 to the minus 4, 2 to the minus 2. This is just experiments to show you that if I do it directly, I'll get larger areas for sure. I'm incrementing my, my ellipse. And if I do so, I'm not compliant with the specification that we stated at the beginning. But the effect of, for example, absorbing or tolerating more risk, so increasing a little bit the risk that I'm assuming, it's definitely have a, a good impact. So it's reducing the area. The balance again, the trade-off. How much can I afford on reducing this um, versus what spec I can really reach, OK? What? OK, OK. Oh, OK. Ah, because it's raining, maybe. OK. Very, very interactive workshop. <laughs> I lo love it. Um, so these two results, as I said, we know we will improve this. We know how we can improve this. But just wanted to show you, you know, all the factors that bring this down and how the, how the, the we wait for, we wait for the thing done because otherwise. So how all the elements play a role here. Hopefully you, you get it and, and I'm, yeah, and I'm illustrating this good enough. So conclusion, we're not there, but we have many ideas on how to get there. So we will get there. Um, yeah, this, so this, this is all this work we, we did with what we have centered around EGNOS and how we can exploit uh, EGNOS accuracy and integrity. Now, we will move to uh, another part. Yep. Why do we have the red cross if they are... I'm stating that I'm not compliant, this one with this one. The expected a priori. No, no, this is, this is, this is T. This, this is T, but what I'm saying here is that this integrity ellipse is actually compared with a 2T specification. Um, the 10 to the minus 4, if you remember the RMP, was supposed to be compared to the 2X, 2T, 2X um, road, okay? But this is actual T, you know what I mean? So if you double this and you take the ellipse, it's not fitting. This is what I'm saying. Yeah, I know it's, it's hard to explain. More questions, and if not, I'll jump to, to some quick conclusions. We have consolidated an enabler for safe drone navigation. So collecting navigation measurements, we know what we have to collect, replaying trajectories, and uh, this uh, replay includes some measures of the safety we can achieve. Now, um, this concept of drone protection level has been built, you know, we have formalization of that, but uh, we need some more consolidation, and it's based on the bubble in the road scheme that I mentioned before. 100 flies process, you have all the statistics, we have all the results, you can cross, you know, variables against this and that. I think I presented the most relevant ones, which are very interesting, because it shows the, the relations with all the types of parameters that come into play for operations beyond navigation, so I think we have to start thinking beyond navigation and thinking on flight patterns on all the variables that come into play. Flight procedures considerably, considerably matter. And we are now curating this concept and uh, validating it with flights in terms of trade-offs. What are the level of risks we can assume here and there and uh, what can we do to improve these DPLs, okay? So here we are. This was from my side, and I think now it's very interesting to jump to uh, demos with Pedro because that complements very much what we've, we've been doing in terms of future panor the future panorama for GNSS and some other integrity aspects, okay? So, hello once again, everyone. 
I am Pedro from Deimos Engineeria, the Portuguese subsidiary of Deimos. And our role in the project was to analyze the four scenarios and derivating um, flight-related requirements, um, coordinate the uh, maritime, maritime surveillance test flights, uh, analyzing the current capacity, future improvements, and lead limits of EGNOS and the RAIM, and compile conclusions on the assessment of current and future EGNOS regarding its compliance to deliver safe air pass navigation. So focusing on uh, this uh, work package, which, which is the, the one I, I, will, um, I will present, uh, it will be a very technical uh, discussion. I, I am sorry if you, if you get bored, but uh, this is the outcome of our simulations and our results. So focusing on this work package, uh, we have uh, done simulations for three service and user types, uh, legacy service GPS single frequency, GPS dual frequency, and GPS plus Galileo dual frequency multi-constellation. The approach here was that we used um, a set of tools, including Deimos s -Pass Service uh, Volume Simulator and Stanford's uh, Mass for RAIM. So several uh, simulations were done in order to, to assess protection levels and navigation system error for all the different service and user types uh, for all of the reality scenarios. So this table is just uh, to remind uh, everyone what is expected uh, for each um, for each uh, scenario, and this is once again the, the million dollar, dollar question. Um, uh, so this serves as a reference for uh, whether or not we are compliant with the, um, with the uh, simulations. Uh, this is for accuracy, and here we have it for integrity. So the, the matter of the two times uh, accuracy is represented here. Uh, as for the integrity risk allocation, we have decided to conduct two types of, sim of simulations. So one of them is in the uh, aeronautical-like um, scenario in which most of the integrity risk is allocated into the vertical uh, axis and the 50-50 apportionment. Uh, it is important to state that the, um, we used 360 seconds for autocorrelation, uh, but we have decided to, to maintain 150 seconds in the table just for the, the sake of completeness. Uh, now on to the results. So um, this is a forecast. I mean, uh, these plots represent the, the service area uh, for the, the European service area for EGNOS. Um, the top plots refer to the uh, navigation system error or accuracy, and the bottom plots um, for the integrity or protection levels for both the horizontal and the uh, and vertical case. Um, so. Uh, this is also a forecast for the expected performance of uh, EGNOS V3. Uh, so in the case of, uh, of GPS single frequency legacy service, we can see that accuracy wise, we already have some pretty good results when it comes to continental Europe. However, this is not true for the, the remaining of the, um, of the service area. And uh, when it comes to the um, uh, protection levels, we can see that um, I, 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 with this performance, it is already uh, expected that we cover uh, the less stringent reality scenarios, like uh, Pera mentioned, the maritime surveillance. We don't need uh, that much uh, integrity because uh, there are um, the airspace is, is pretty free, and we have a lot of availability. Uh, this is the same result for the the 50/50 uh, apportionment. Now, if we add dual frequency into the into the mix, we can see that uh, accuracy-wise. Almost the entirety of the service area is covered with, uh, with good results. And integrity-wise, all of the reality scenarios become, um, become doable. Remember that this is for, for EGNOS V3. Uh, here, we have the same results for the 50-50 apportionment. And finally, it is clear that if we add Galileo into the equation, uh, the performance becomes further enhanced. So we have better results for everything and for the entirety of the uh, European service area. And here, the same results for the 50-50 for the apportionment. Uh, now on to Arayim. Um, we can see that um, um, it, it was, it was uh, when running the, the Arayim simulations, it was um, the GPS uh, constants uh, of the algorithm were fixed as per working group C report three. Um, except for the, the, um, the total integrity budget, as was done with EGNOS. And uh, for Galileo, we have decided to, 
to um, to keep uh, this this sort of um, degree of liberties in what we can change uh, in order to assess the different results. So uh, for this set of parameters, we achieve this kind of results and so on. And these results and these parameters were the user range accuracy and the prior probability of satellites uh, per, fault, per fault approach and the integrity budget for both vertical and horizontal. Just to remind you, because uh, some people here may not know what RAIM is, uh, in a very succinct way, RAIM provides an integrity support message to be used by the receiver in order to assess protection levels. Um, so, as I was saying in the previous slide, the uh, parameters for GPS were fixed, and we played around with the Galileo parameters a, a bit more. It is important to refer that what is stated by the GSA, now, now EUSPA, when it comes to user range accuracy for Galileo, it is six meters are, are stated. However, we took into consideration a paper that um, analyzed the, the current performance of, um, of a RAIM for Galileo, and uh, those are the, are the results achieved from 2017 to 2020. So a really intensive test mm -hmm. scenario was conducted, and we can see that for the current performance, it is not nearly good enough. Uh, none of the reality scenarios are covered here. However, if we can become, uh, if, we, if we want to become a bit more optimistic and um, what, what, what the future can bring to Galileo, we can see that if we upgrade to three meters, Euro, uh, the less uh, stringent scenarios of reality become doable. And uh, if we enhance it even further, up to one meter, same as GPS, almost all of the reality scenarios become covered. Uh, it is also important to notice that PSAT um, is defined as per the paper, but if it is stated by the, the, the GSA, uh, this is the same results for the 50-50 apportionment, but if we do it the, the same way that uh, GSA or EUSPA is stating as of now, maintaining Euro to, to one meter, uh, we can see that the performance it doesn't change much. So it is concluded that Eura is the key factor here and what should be improved Galileo-wise, and this is sort of the, the suggestion for, uh, for EOSPA or for the, um, the future improvements of Galileo, that most of the reality scenarios become doable if we upgrade Eura to, to one meter. And here the, the same results for the 50-50 for the apportionment. So since Deimos was responsible for the maritime surveillance tests, we decided to conduct the same simulations um, in, for, for our tests. And the way we've done, is, we've done this is that we took into, into consideration the, um, the position that was computed by the receiver, and we, we made this a, an input to, to the previous tools that I've mentioned. And we also uh, took the liberty and care of only providing the, the tools with the uh, available satellites at the time of the flights. So this yields a really good comparison between Agnos V2, uh, which was used during the actual flights um, with GPS single frequency legacy service and Agnos V3 um, GPS dual frequency, which was used for the simulations, uh, the so-called uh, theoretical results in the presentation. Um, so it is also important to, to take into account that the uh, protection levels, um, the outcome of the protection levels by the receiver using Agnos V2 were scaled so, uh, to the same integrity risks uh, of, um, of Agnos V3 and, and, and the ones we used in the simulations so that the comparison can be coherent. This is just um, to show you a visual uh, representation of the flights that were conducted. This is one of the flights in the Portuguese coast of, uh, of Troia. And here we have the results. Uh, for, uh, for ESPAS, we can see a, a significant difference uh, ratio-wise um, when we used Agnos V3 instead of Agnos V2. And uh, here are the results for our aim, which unfortunately we don't have a, a comparison for the, um, for the actual flights. So in conclusion, with uh, GPS single frequency, uh, the performance is not good enough um, if we consider the entirety of the service area. If we add dual frequency onto the mix, um, the, all of the reality scenarios become covered. Uh, however, this may not be enough for the entirety of the service area. Uh, but for, um, but if, we, if we add Galileo into the mix, which is uh, the, the importance of, uh, for Elspy and, and for us as Galileo, as European citizens, uh, we can see that uh, we have a big 
um, boost in performance, and therefore all of the reality scenarios become a, a, a achievable uh, for SPAS. Um, for, for SPAS. Um, so as I, as I was mentioning, the, the impact of using double frequency is undoubtedly advantageous, and adding one more constellation into the mix, uh, Galileo in this case, we supply the system with an additional boost in performance that it is definitely going to be needed for future iterations, and especially if we consider also the availability of satellites in the, in the sky. Um, so in regards to RAIM, it was understood that using the current uh, Galileo performance, if we can get EURA up to one meter, uh, same as GPS, um, it, it is almost guaranteed that we will achieve, um, the, we will be compliant with all of the reality scenarios. Um, since they are not far from being achieved already. So, as I, as I was mentioned already, URA is concluded to be the key factor here. And this is just a, a visual representation for you to know the difference that um, upgrading URA from three to one meters does. We can see a whole lot more of, uh, of reality scenarios being covered. Um, this was already mentioned already, so we have a, a significant difference when we move from EGNOS V2 to EGNOS V3. And the, the protection limits are well above the obtained theoretical and, um, and actual results for both ESPAS and RAIM. When I mention ESPAS, I mean, I mean EGNOS. It is the satellite-based augmentation system for Europe. Uh, so finally, with EGNOS V3 on its way, Europe can guarantee safe flights uh, for dro drone operations. Uh, future Galileo improvements should yield better PSAT, better PCONS, better EURA, hopefully. And as a consequence, all of the reality scenarios will become achievable. We are confident on these from our simulations, uh, since they are not far from being achieved already, I would say. And in conclusion, reality is helping tailor air pass to navigation requirements, into navigation performance, and safety requirements. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro. Questions for Pedro? Yeah. Go ahead. Punch. <laughs> Pedro, thank you, but that was fast. That, that was fast. That was fast. Yes. <laughs> this said, why are you assuming that, uh, by the way, you are in user range accuracy? This might be helpful for, for people to know, but why are you assuming that the Euro of GPS is better than the Euro? Uh, this is, this is uh, when it comes to GPS, this is not an, uh, so much of an as assumption as it is um, kind of a fact since these have been. Um, um, intensive uh, tests that were conducted from many, many years now and uh, what is stated by USPA as of now is that we get um, EURA under, under 60 meters. From the paper that, that I mentioned, we can get it up to 4.5 meters as of now and for GPS, uh, as per working group C report 3, if I'm not mistaken, this is something that has been um, stated that, that of the current uh, performance of GPS which I believe uh, Galileo is, is on its way to, to, to also achieve a year of one meter. In our experience, the, the, at least the precision, which is something different of Galileo, when we do the, our computations, it's always better than, than the GPS. GPS? For user range accuracy? Well, it's, it's the noise of the pseudo range. Oh, okay, but, but when it comes to RAM, this is, this is not the case. And, uh, uh, I'm sure this is a workshop, but I don't have all the information right now, but for sure I can provide you with the paper I'm talking about, and you will see that the uh, current performance of Galileo is not quite there yet when it comes to, to Euro. I think maybe, Ismael, you mean especially for GPS, why GPS is so low, maybe, or...? No, well, I mean, if you're talking about accuracy, we know it brings everything together. But this I do not understand. So maybe there's some missing concept here in between. Yeah. And we are not talking the same thing. But anyway. Yeah, yeah, talking okay. about RAIM specifically. Well, you know, we can sort it out uh, later, right? Okay. Oh. Yes. So Absolutely. I, I, will, I will try yes. to, to send you the paper. So the, 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 just to clarify, the thing is how, why there's this big difference between URA on GPS and why Galileo is actually it's higher. It's yeah, but we are not talking about PVT, you know, uh, with, uh, for example, the high accuracy service with Galileo Signal E6, 
uh, this is not the same. This is for PVT wise and RAM wise, and these are two different different things. And uh, and uh, it, it is clear from the paper that the performance of Galileo is is not quite there yet. Okay, so maybe I don't know. We can we can sort it out later. More questions. Yeah. Uh, that future value improvement, what kind of improvement? Good question. Uh, yeah, so, so I mean improvements in general, right? so uh, as of now we have uh, Galileo ECX IO Curacy service uh, incoming, so uh, I am sure that these, these uh, the, the PCONS, PSAT and EURA uh, parameters are not going to stay the same for the upcoming years, so technology keep, keeps improvements. Uh, Galileo keeps improvement, and this is a, sort of a, a forecast, a provision of, of what of what should be achievable. Since, as I mentioned already, we are not far from from achieving it already. Uh, therefore, it's it's a, it's a matter of time, I would say. Maybe a short question: if you could, how do you define URA? So it's a user range accuracy uh, in 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 the scope of of our RAM, which is the advanced receiver. Um, autonomous in integrity message. So this is, these are the integrity messages that we have been talking about. So Agnos does it the way uh, Perry already explained, and uh, Arame is um, is maybe an older uh, algorithm, algorithm I would say that does the same. And, and uh, we decided to conduct the analysis for both Agnos and Arame because they they can perhaps complement each other in the future. And so you, it's user range accuracy uh, in regards to to, to Arame. We, we do it offline, maybe. Uh, I have one more question regarding V3, because it's what in line with what Herman was saying. And I don't know if Pablo mentioned that, when V3 is coming to a reality, actually. Yeah, yeah. When, when is so. it the plans for deployment for V3? I think it's by, uh, by, by 2025 or... Okay. Because the, the, because that's good. I mean, what you, sh what you showed here. Mm -hmm. We're basically saying we, we need more from what we have to really get it down to mm -hmm. what, what we want. Both in terms of, the, of double frequency or triple frequencies, multi-constellation, but also Egnos itself. So, mm -hmm. so that's interesting. 2025, okay. We, can, we, we have to wait then. <laughs> Good. Just one question. Ernest. I assume that uh, you are considering the use of Egnos for the corrections, yeah. the technical corrections. Not for the integrity messages or other services below that are for aeronautical purposes, just for uh, the correction services. Have you considered the use of uh, ground services? So that the use of, sorry? Ground services for augmentation. Of ground services for augmentation. So, I mean, so the drones are not flying mm -hmm. too much of this uh, is higher, higher and, uh, and maybe they can get the benefit. Because you can apply right now these yes. corrections directly to Galileo, GPS, Dronas, and they, and, and they do. This is, this is a good question. Just to, just to understand, you mean something like uh, GBAS, right? GBAS, like yeah. no? gram based. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think, I, I'm not sure if, if, uh, if Pablo can back me up here, but I think the, the importance and um, the objective of Egnos is that it's, it's an available service worldwide. And, and if we do it by satellite, we don't need to have. Um, the installation of, of, of GBAS in every airport, in every... Uh, uh, already have it. I mean, if you look at the coverage of these services uh, in Europe, they are already there. Okay, this okay. is an existing infrastructure, all, all over Europe at least. Yeah, okay. yeah, that's interesting. GBAS? No, not GBAS, but maybe correction services yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, correction of services, stations. You have uh, several providers, like one of them. Uh, <laughs> 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 you have to tell my book too. Right, right. <laughs> Okay. No, that, yeah, sure. So no, you but, but it's I, a pertinent question, and, and I believe. It's a program that, that, that is, it's trying to promote the use of Egnos, and it's. Uh, but I, I'm. Sure. I, I thought that it was more oriented to the use of the integrity message instead of the correction, but I'm not sure. Okay. If it's just using the correction. So, for example, for what I presented, I'm using the corrections of Egnos to improve the codes, yeah. but. I talked about a, a different integrity scheme based more like on a RAIM type to generate these ellipses. Exactly. We did it, but not based, not, not trying to avoid, let's say, the aviation grade integrity things that come from Egnos. Okay? Although there is a part that we use because it talks about, for example, the noise 
the quality of the EGNOS measurements. This is part of the integrity part of EGNOS. Yeah. You still use it because you need it. So you have improved your code, you need that. But in, in short, uh, I'm, I'm avoiding this part, this aviation grade. Pedro was talking more when you were talking about SBAS integrity and, and protection levels out of that. I believe there's a, a scheme, aviation grade scheme to generate this protection level yeah, still, right? Absolutely. So it's like two types of, of the AirPass. And yeah, but yeah, we, we use the, the Agnos uh, V3 algorithm already with a message there is type an 28. Exactly. So it, it's, it would be more like the aviation grade okay. for that part. Okay. But, but still, your question is super interesting. Mm -hmm. We have infrastructure on the ground able to compute corrections, say for accuracy or for integrity, maybe, you know, denser than, you know, one Jiva station, which is it. Uh, what my point is uh, that uh, all, all satellite operators are moving to a multi-operational scenario. So where all will be sharing the same modulation, BPSK, so that, that you can use all, all four stations in the future. And uh, I, I, I see here an approach that is very, um, I don't know, but maybe it's too isolated on mm -hmm. GPS only and then mm -hmm. having a little, but uh, I don't know if, or maybe now it's the time to do this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Awesome. And uh, what, what do you see about the, what will be the benefit of this multi-constellation on these scenarios? So the, the advantage. Yeah. Uh, so what will be the benefit when you have all this multi, um, this multi-constellation uh, modulation available for, for uh, integral operation of real one? Um, and, and these are scenarios of integrity, do you expect to have a much more benefit? So it's just uh, yeah, uh, the from, from from results? Yeah, I think it's a bit, yeah, what, what you, you were... So we draw, uh, we had to focus on EGNOS because that was primarily, I mean, the project. And, and actually, the most part is going another path, right? So adding constellations, adding frequencies. Maybe it's not total, we don't have Beidou here. Uh, yeah. We don't have uh, GLONASS. We focused on GPS Galileo. Well, okay, that's... that's uh, let's say more room for improvement, you know, it can only get better. But, but uh, yeah, that, that's a bit the compliment mm -hmm. that uh, Pedro was doing here. But I mean, I uh, just to, just if I can, if I may. So uh, you are saying that most airports and, and even drone centers like this one, they already have, uh, most of them have uh, some uh, sort of um, a ground uh, augmentation system like GBUS, but not quite GBUS. Is that what you were no, suggesting? Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's where I wanted to get because for uh, package delivering, for example, maybe it is not so viable to, to have this sort of uh, ground augmentation approach, but uh, EGNOS v3 would cover the entirety of the service area, and maybe that's what uh, the point of using, of using EGNOS uh, without. Uh, I'm just, I'm just yeah, yeah, yeah. That is a resource that mm -hmm. Yeah. But absolutely, I think it's a, it's a pretty good idea. Actually, even for these missions, it makes sense. For example, package delivery, right? You're, you're going from a warehouse to some spots. Maybe, okay, let, do not think on package delivery on the house, you know? Yeah. But to a place where you do a last mile, which is more realistic, okay? If those places are known and they are always the same, it makes sense to deploy something in there which would affect or would improve on the final phases, right? On takeoff and landing, which is actually where you need it most. Because on, while you're flying, you know, on the W to W, which is always the terminology we use here, well, you're open air, you know, you're segregated, you have to find your spaces, should be fine. But on the most critical parts, let's say, on the, on the extremes, if they're always on the same side, it makes sense to use something which is deployed there, you know, to, to, to correct. So to me, it uh, makes perfect sense and it's, it's good. When we were, we were defining this project, and we were at the beginning of this project, one of the questions we were asking ourselves was, could we achieve some level of safety uh, without using ground infrastructure okay. or should we have specific ground infrastructure to, uh, to reach that level of safety. And what Pedro has even presented here is that if you wait until Eggnor's 3, mm -hmm. then you don't need it. Which probably is not good for the providers of Chivas <laughs> services. <laughs> but, but globally, for the benefit of 
small budget yeah. is very good it's much more because, because the more Europe invests in global infrastructure which serve all of us for free, then the better. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there is no stand I mean, there is an entry standard for providing the services, but not standardized access to the all standardization would be the other uh, nightmare. Yeah. 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 I will wait until the year 2025 <laughs> to buy a new smartphone <laughs> so I get better conversion fee. You could add it as a contingency plan in case that they not suffer <laughs> some, uh, some issue. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, thank you. Ah, oh, yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, I think you have a comparison between two scenarios with GPS only and then GPS plus Galileo. Yeah. Do you have another one with Galileo only? Uh, we didn't do um, for Galileo only, but it, it would be interesting to see. But the, um, the way things are right now, so for example, Egnos v, v2, it, it focuses only on, on GPS, uh, which is unfortunate. But I think with, uh, with the addition of Egnos v3, it will become uh, uh, you know, multi constellation also for, uh, for Egnos wise. And therefore, since we have already have GPS, maybe it, may, it doesn't make sense to, to focus on, on Galileo solo, but uh, it would be interesting to see. Just, just in case the regulators decide to switch off access to GPS. <laughs> <laughs> that, but that, that is very important. That, that is would very be important. Very yes. disruptive for any of the areas mm -hmm. that rely on Genesis service. That is very important, yes. So, like anytime they go to war. Absolutely. Which is why, you know, which is why maybe GPS as a partnership with Galileo directly, for example, for RM, they did a working group C is, is like a partnership between the United States and, and the European Union, if I'm not mistaken. And we, they don't do it with China and then Russia for, for may, I, I would guess for that specific reason. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay. Thanks, Pedro. I should we might. Do. I think next slide was about to, sorry, what? Uh, yeah, leave it here. Thank you. Um, I think we were wrapping up. Yep. Um, it's about the time. So that's a bit of a wrap up conclusions you can read here. Um, we will need to come closer with drones. That's, I think that's a, that's a fact. If you really want to unleash what you know, what they're meant to be. Remember my, my first slide, right? The size of the business. Um, and for that, we need tighter spatial margins. And this is what it's all about. We're working for that. If you need tighter spatial requirements, we need to know how to get there, okay? And that affects, and I think it's one of the most valuable uh, lessons learned in reality, it doesn't only affect the drone or the equipment of the drone. It affects the operation and many other things that maybe you cannot foresee now, but they do have uh, uh, an effect on that. Um, EGNOS has a significant contribution, but we just had the discussion about how good we can get with further, uh, with other things, future things, right? MCMF, multi-constellation, multi-frequency, okay? And EGNOS V3. So we have built, our project was about building a logic around this based on redundancy, a lot of flights, you know, to really get to characterize so that also it serves, or we intend that reality serves as a, as a checkup table. Like if you guys or any of you guys are in further projects and you want to know what, what's the deal, you know, I'm using this, what can I get? We have done the exercise, right? Um, and also testing in operational scenarios because it was interesting to, you know, rehearse real scenarios in that. And we have built this enabler, which for sure it's available for further flights and if any of you would like to use that. So that's, I think it's a nice outcome also for reality. So that's it. I think, yeah, that was, uh, there was a pre-lunch QA, but I think we also, <laughs> we anticipated. Thanks, Ernest. <laughs> no, it's good. And, uh, and maybe we're set for lunch. So if no more questions, or if you have questions, we take them for that's lunch, well. okay? <laughs> good, thanks again, everybody. Uh, good to see you again in these times. So we can shake hands again, as I said before, and have a nice lunch. Thank you, Peter.